the Public Works and Utilities Committee for August 24th to order. Uh, could we have a roll call, please, Ms. Pisula? Chairman Christopher Rivera. Here. Councilor Romana Beta. Here. Councilor Joanne V. Hill Coppler. Here. Councilor Michael Garcia. Present. Councilor Sidney Lindell. Here. You have a quorum, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Pasula. Next, uh, approval of the agenda. Any changes from staff? Um, John Romero first. No oh, changes, Mr. Chair. Anything from you, Mr. Jones? I have no changes, Mr. Chair. All right, anything from the committee? What are the wishes of the committee? Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second for the approval of the agenda. The motion was by Councillor Lindell, second by Councillor Vihill Coppler. Any further discussion? C9, can we have a roll call, please, Ms. Basilla? Chairman Christopher Rivera? Yes. Councillor Romana Beta? Yes. Councillor Joanne V. Hill Coppler? Yes. Councillor Michael Garcia? Yes. Councillor Signe Lindell? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, before we get on to approf uh, approval of the consent agenda, there were several items that were sent out. <clears throat> um, I think it was this morning by Ms. Pisula, which were uh, the minutes as well as uh, some other uh, documentation regarding some of the resolutions I think that are in the packet. So hope everyone had a chance to look at those. Uh, with that uh, approval of the consent agenda, uh, any changes from you, Mr. Romero? No changes, Mr. Chair. How about from you, Mr. Jones? There are no changes, Mr. Chair. All right, what would like, is there anything that committee would like to pull off the agenda? Uh, Councillor Lindell, I see your hand up. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, item C and item G. Hold on, let me grab another pen real quick. That was item C and G, Councilor Lindell? Yes, thank you, Chair. Okay, anything else? Uh, Councilor Vihil Coppola, I see your hand up. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to pull item B, C. Is E the capital improvements? I think it is. I think that's G. That's item G, Councillor. I'm sorry, that is G. Okay. Um, I. J. And M. All right, recap those. B is in boy, C is in Charlie, G, I, J, and M. Yeah, B, C, G, I, J, and M. Okay. Uh, Councilor Beta, anything from you? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Councilor Garcia. Uh, just for the record, item C and G. But nothing new that hasn't been called. All right. Okay. Uh, so we have items B, C, G, I, J, and M. Uh, any further discussion? What are the wishes of the committee? Move to approve. Motion. Second. Motion for approval is amended by Councilor Lindell and a second by Councilor Garcia. Any further discussion? Sina, can we have a roll call vote, Ms. Pasula? Chairman Christopher Rivera? Yes. Councillor Romana Beta? Yes. Councillor Joanne V. Hill Coppler? Yes. Councillor Michael Garcia? Yes. Councillor Signe Lindell? 
Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. We're under approval of the minutes from August 10th. Uh, any changes from staff, uh, John or Emily? No changes, Mr. Chair. No changes as well. All right, anything from your side, Mr. Jones or Ms. Ray Diaz? And none from each, Mr. Chair. None for me, Mr. Chair. All right, any changes from the committee? Look to approve wishes? the minutes. Second. Move to approve the minutes. All right, we have a motion for approval by Councilor Garcia, a second from Councilor Lindell. Any further discussion? All right, can we have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Pasula? Chairman Christopher Rivera? Yes. Councilor Roman Abeta? Yes. Councilor Joanne Bijo Coppler? Yes. Councilor Michael Garcia? Yes. Councillor Sydney Lindell? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Next on the, any uh, public comment, anything from you, Ms. Pasula? No, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Ray Diaz? Mr. Chair, I don't have any public comment. All right, public comment section is closed. Now with regards to the uh, presentation, uh, I was told it would take five minutes, so we'll hold you to that, uh, Mr. Delmar. And then uh, we'll give about five minutes for any questions as well. So uh, Mr. Delmar, go ahead. And uh, if you have any content to share, or if you just want to verbalize your presentation, the floor is yours. OK, thank you, Mr. Chair. I've got a presentation here that um, I will go through very quickly. It, it typically is a little more than five minutes, but I'm happy to, to trim it down. Um, just a quick introduction. My name is John Del Mar. I'm an engineer with the water division. I started just in February and I wanted to share some of the improvements we've made to the uh, water reuse system within the, uh, the effluent reuse in the city. Let me just fire this up. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just a quick background, um, the Paseo Real plant is currently serving eight effluent users, uh, Marty Sanchez, MRC, Swan Park, and the standpipe there at the uh, Paseo Real plant are all what we could categorize as direct city use. And then a different additional users like the Country Club and the Downs um, maintain and monitor their own um, infrastructure, but they, they take the same effluent. Um, during the summer months, it averages 1.8 million gallons of a day of effluent reuse with the peak in June, with a total plant flow of roughly four and a half to five and a half. Um, whatever is not reused is discharged to the lower Santa Fe River. Um, the city's primary assets include the MRC pipeline and the city's standpipe at the Paseo Real plant. The pipeline includes a pump station and pipeline outlined here in the map going from the plant to the MRC and Marty Sanchez as well as Swan Park. Um, there's also storage ponds at each of those places. Um, new infrastructure that was recently acquired this year is the Las Campanas pipeline. That also includes a pump station at the Paseo Real plant, um, currently not operational seven and a half miles of pipe that goes parallel to the MRC line and then beyond MRC and Marty Sanchez out to Las Campanas. And that system also includes a two million gallon tank. So it's um, some significant infrastructure that we're working on getting up and running. And we actually have some of it going already, which I'll highlight here in a minute. Um, this is just a quick plot on sort of the seasonal use you can see heavy in the summer, very low in the winter months. Uh, if we were to look at just the month of June, you would see that the two golf courses, the light blue here is Marty Sanchez, light green is the country club. They're the heaviest users. And then sort of a secondary usage would be places like the MRC, Swan Park. Um, this is the month of June and you can see even in the month of June, I'm oh, sorry, we have total inflow of the plant, roughly 5 million gallons a day. So the difference between this usage and the inflow would be what is going down the river. 
So you can kind of get a feel for what's left on any given day. Of course, the problem, which I think most people are aware of, is that when the plant goes down, um, that water can't be delivered. So those compliance issues generally last three to 16 days. There's a table here of sort of what we've seen this year. Um, and when that happens, uh, city facilities like MRC and Marty and even Swamp Park um, are very vulnerable because they don't have good alternative backup supplies. Um, their on-site storage might last for about a week depending on reservoir levels, usage and, and weather, var various uh, factors. So that sort of drove us to the improvements that we've been making over the last four months or so. Um, here's again the map. Um, basically four main items. Starting on the upper left, we've got uh, dual fire hydrants on Wildlife Way. I'll, I'll kind of detail each one of these quickly after this. Um, up at Las Campanas, um, the Las Campanas Golf Club has made um, themselves some interconnections to their irrigation ponds that were not previously um, present. And then we've got an interconnection between the MRC and the LC pipeline on Caja del Rio Road across from uh, Marty, Marty Sanchez and Wildlife Way. And then of course the pump station and tank improvements back at the plant. So the dual fire hydrants um, have been installed. They're fully operational. Um, it allows uh, direct transfer of potable water from a pressurized potable hydrant to a non-pressurized effluent hydrant. Um, Anytime you make a connection like that, you need a very robust backflow prevention system, which we have. This system was tested um, July 13th. And down here is sort of a results, basically showing with varying levels of uh, more, less robust backflow. All of this is very good backflow prevention. You can deliver anywhere from about 160,000 gallons a day up to almost a million gallons a day of potable water directly into the MRC line, which could be used hey, at the, oh, sorry. I can interrupt you for a second. Councilor Garcia, you have a question. Is it related to something Mr. Delmar just presented? No, no, Mr. Chair. I think that was a uh, uh, old hand that was raised. All right, thank you. Sorry, Mr. Delmar, go ahead. Oh, no problem, Mr. Chair. Um, the, the city invested about $20,000 in this improvement. Um, it's operational. And with these flow rates, if the course were closed, you could get by on the lowest sort of flows, very safest methods. Um, if you went for the direct connect with the backflow prevention, still um, very robust, you could keep uh, Marty Sanchez open and MRC open with that 1 million gallons a day under most conditions. Um, Las Campanas pump house improvements. This sort of captures all the improvements that need to be made to the pump station, tank, and pipeline that we recently acquired. This work is in progress. We hope to have it finished this fall. This will provide backup pumping for MRC and Marty, direct pumping to Las Campanas, and as well as that uh, storage tank. And there's pictures there of sort of the various facilities. Um, the interconnections is really where it gets a little more interesting. Um, there were two interconnections. One is up at Las Campanas where they interconnected the existing pipeline to their storage ponds and irrigation systems, which wasn't previously done. And they did all that, um, their own investment, 150,000 roughly for their improvements. They sort of did that in parallel. We invested about 20,000 in an in interconnection between the two pipelines there at um, across from Wildlife Way. And what's interesting here is that this is a, now allows us to do bi-directional flow. We can flow effluent from the plant to Las Campanas, and that's a, a source of revenue for the plant, but we can also flow that raw water that uh, Las Campanas has in their large uh, reservoir storage ponds back to MRC and Marty if the plant goes out. So that would be maybe a preferable to using potable water in that, uh, that situation. So just sort of a, a high level view, if you can imagine the Paseo plant here, um, Las Campanas on the other side, with the using the MRC pumps, which is currently um, available infrastructure, 
We can pump through that interconnection there at Caja and Wildlife Way into this Las Campanas line through a high point manhole over to Las Campanas and deliver effluent with those MRC pumps until the LC pumps are operational. But then to go re reverse, we could actually use a pump station at Las Campanas, pump again back over the high point through the interconnection and to the MRC and Marty Ponds or down the pipeline to Swan Park. So we tested both of those systems using existing infrastructure. We can deliver about two and a half million gallons a day to Las Campanas and we can get about 1.4 million gallons a day from Las Campanas. Um, potential next steps, we've got Corolla Engineering writing a report that's evaluating some secondary treatment options and some additional connections at the Paseo Real plant. Um, we can do some improvements to our water accounting and management, basically understanding what we have at any given time, what can be delivered and what needs to be saved for the river. Um, updating and reviewing our discharge permits, documenting our operational strategies and procedures and making sure everybody is properly trained on those. Of course, completing the Las Campanas pump station improvements. And then in future, if, you know, if there's a return flow pipeline, that of course will impact this system as well. And hopefully that was five minutes. I'd like to open it up to any questions. Close enough. Thank you, Mr. Delmar. Uh, any questions for uh, Mr. Delmar? Uh, Councilor Lindell. Yeah, could you go back to, uh, it was approximately uh, page three. If you scoot up through your deck there, I'd be able to tell, oh, whoa, 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 let's see. It is page five. Could you go to page five, please? I, I wasn't, I'm just trying to, um, why in June, of 20, why is the Santa Fe Country Club using so much effluent and Marty Sanchez is using none? I, I see 620 and 621. Okay, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, Councilor uh, Lindell. Um, 620 and 621, this plot is, it's kind of a mixture of data. Um, what we're seeing here is a combination of water that's being pumped from the plant in some cases. That would be true for the country club where we're actually monitoring what's leaving the plant. In the case of Marty Sanchez, we're seeing what they used on that particular day as opposed to what was being, what left the plant. So we don't have really consistent monitoring um, between the users, days where, you know, at the beginning of the month, there was, um, the plant was actually down. So there, there was little usage citywide, but those that used it were using it very carefully. And that was being monitored at the site. I guess I can't answer why the country, why Marty Sanchez would not have been using water on those days. Um, it's possible that um, either, you know, their system, monitoring system might have been down those days. Um, it's also possible that they just didn't water those days, although I think that's unlikely. Uh, um, unfortunately, I, I really don't know why they, why we don't have any data for Marty Sanchez okay. it, on those days. Yeah, it's, it, it's fine to say you don't know. That's not a problem. I just wondered. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, did you were you yielding the floor, Councilor Lindell, or do you have any other yeah, questions? Yes, I am, Chair. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Um, John, so you mentioned a, a backup for uh, MRC and also for um, Swan Park. Does this backup include uh, other users like the Country Club, or would they still be forced to use potable water? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. They, these improvements we've made do not help the country club. Basically, they're all focused on those top three city users that I introduced. Um, the, 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 the standpipe is also not, um, does not benefit, although that's one of the options that's being considered is to do another interconnection 
where that two million gallon tank could go to the standpipe. But these other four users do not benefit from the, the reuse improvements we've been doing this summer. You think it would be valuable to include at least the country club, which is a high user in that so that uh, again, if, if the if the site is down, um, at least they're using uh, the backup um, effluent instead of drinking water. Um, I think it would be possible to maybe do an interconnection to that 2 million gallon tank um, because it's all the infrastructure is all located there at Paseo Real. Um, to get the other sources like from Las Campanas would be a little more challenging because the, you know, just the relative locations, um, that hasn't really been on the drawing board and neither has really adding it the two million gallon tank, though it, it could be considered. All right, if uh, it's something you guys can look at, I think that would be valuable. Again, anytime we can use uh, effluent instead of uh, potable water, I think that it would, it's worth looking into, so. Um, Councillor Lindell, you raised your hand again. Uh, yes, I was wondering if we could have this uh, deck, uh, presentation deck forwarded to us. Mr. Yeah, Mr. Mark, Chair, you... Councillor Lindell, I'm happy to provide it. Thank you very yeah, if you, much. If you could I, provide I, it to the, thank you, Councillor. Yeah. If you could provide it to the whole committee, that would be great. Uh, well, Councillor Beta. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Mr. Del Mar. So, uh, just so that I understand, if so, when the plant goes down again, obviously we get I get calls about the golf course. We do have a backup now in place. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor Abeta. Right now, if the plant were to go down, and I assume you're talking about Marty Sanchez, um, yes. we have two possible backups. One would be the um, water transfer from the Las Campanas ponds, the raw water, and then the second would be potable. Both of those are operational at this time. Okay, and they weren't operational a few months ago, and that's why uh, we kept calling Mr. Jones and asking him when he was going to get the, the plant back up and running. Yes, sir, correct. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I need to uh, give a shout out to Mr. Jones for getting this done because like I said, we would get calls and then we would start emailing and calling him. And so I appreciate uh, that we got this taken care of. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Beta. Any other questions? All right, I see none. Uh, I also wanted to thank uh, Mr. Jones, Mr. Delmar, uh, both of your teams. Um, again, for getting this done. Uh, very important, I think, to uh, the health of our fields and um, really such a huge asset and, and the cost of having to replace uh, a green was a little surprising to me. So uh, thank you for getting this done. Really do appreciate it. Uh, thank you for sticking to your time as well, Mr. Delmar. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Councilors. All right, now we're on to our uh, consent agenda. And the first item is item B, which was pulled by Councillor uh, V. Hill Coppler. Councillor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just had a, a couple of questions. I wanted to know um, if there was any cost breakdown on the amount of fuel that is spent for those living outside of Santa Fe, and and if is there any cost sharing in that? There you go. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Councilor uh, Bihel Coppler. Um, so for the cost sharing, there's not a cost sharing. Um, Currently, um, in the POE contract, there is a car plan that is uh, agreed upon by both the city and the POE. Um, and as for the cost for commuting, um, we could look at um, 
seeing what the cost is for commuting. There was a snapshot that was provided during the um, budget process uh, to kind of give a snapshot of those that live in the city versus those that commute from outside the city within the authorized take home um, distance. Um, but um, the numbers right now for that cost, we'd have to get those compiled and have to follow up with that at a later time. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, I, I'm just asking the questions. I don't want to imply that I'm against all of this, uh, but I think it's important to know the numbers. And uh, so, so I would appreciate if, if it's not too difficult of, of a task to get that information. Would that be okay? Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilor Verheel Coppler, uh, we could start getting the information put together. Um, one of the factors I know that's going to be difficult for us to do is to determine, uh, do the employee commute all four days? Do they have a five-day work week? And that's what we do with that snapshot to see what it looked like. And we'll have to take into account um, if they worked uh, an extra duty day, like a, a fifth day on overtime to kind of see what that cost is looking like. So uh, we can start looking at that and working diligently to put that together. And um, we can provide that because I know that's a question everyone has. And uh, something else that we are also looking at because we do know that the fuel cost is a significant cost. Um, we'll be coming forward to um, this committee, finance and the governing body uh, with some vehicles moving forward. And with those vehicles, um, Ford currently offers a pursuit rated vehicle that is a hybrid, which has a significant fuel saving cost and when the vehicles at idle, it actually goes over to the battery and it can utilize that. So that's helpful if they're on a scene, if they're on a traffic stop or if the vehicle is there while they're doing paperwork. So we are conscious of that. We're looking at that as a cost savings. And um, based on the initial data we're seeing from the vehicle and the cost savings that we could realize is uh, really significant. So that's something we're looking to explore. Um, thank you. Uh, let me let me go back to your, you know, you did a, a very well thought out uh, formula for how you would figure out what the cost is per officer and such. And, and I'm primarily thinking of maybe just a, a real, a simple formula, like, you know, what officers live out of Santa Fe, uh, how many miles round trip is that? And then, you know, per, you know, how many officers, and, and I know they live in different places. So just, you know, that kind of miles round trip, and then just what's the average price per gallon and multiply that out. That's about all I think it would take for my satisfaction, not necessarily going, you know, officer to officer and what shifts they work. That's, that's way monumental. And, and it's not at all, I think, a good use of time. But uh, a more simple, simple formula would be, I think, satisfactory to me. Mr. Chair, uh, Councilor Hill Coppler, I think that's doable. You know, for us, we can look at the uh, round trip miles that are commuted um, and compile that list. And um, we can look at what an average is across the board. I think that'd be um, uh, fairly um, manageable to go and provide. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor Hill Coppler. Uh, any other questions for Chief Valdez? So I'll move for approval. Second, Mr. Chair. A motion for approval on item B from Councilor Vihil Coppler and a second from Councilor Garcia. Any further discussion? We have a roll call vote, Ms. Pasula, please. Chairman Christopher Rivera. Yes. Councilor Roman Abeta. Yes. Councilor Joanne Vihil Coppler. Yes. Councilor Michael Garcia. Yes. Councilor Signe Lindell. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Next round, uh, item C. Um, Councilor Lindell, I believe you pulled that first. I did. Um, let me try to get to that. Um, in the memo, it has write-off procedures and it says the utility billing division was directed to wait on our needed write-off for closed accounts between 1999 and uh, 2015. 
did the council direct that? Uh, no, Councillor. Uh, the finance director requested that until they could get the CAFR and so on and so forth finished. So I will now be bringing forward the original request plus adding an additional year, uh, which would have been 2016's closed accounts. And hopefully we can get that um, approved through the finance department and then obviously through all of the committees and to council so that we can do the write-off procedures in January of 2021. So what's the total write-off time period that we're looking at? Uh, so it goes back to uh, 1999 when we did, when the utility department had um, two different upgrades to two different billing systems. Um, so there will be, uh, it's about $84,000 for one of the upgrades, which would have been from um, PNM's bill, billing system to um, at the time the original billing system that the utilities had. Uh, then we have about $45,000 for the write-off from the, what I call the second system, which is what utility billing had um, in end of 1999 into 2000. Uh, and then there will be uh, accounts from 2002 um, all the way through 2016. Now there was a write-off that the counselors approved in 2017 and that was from 2002 through 2012 and that was about 2.6 million. Um, but what we have found is there is unfortunately just a couple of stragglers, probably around 90 accounts from 2002 to 2012 that for whatever reason either didn't get rid of, written off completely or um, were missed on the first write-off. So I've got to kind of catch that up. And then uh, state, the New Mexico state allows us to write off any account that's four years or older. Um, and since the first write-off was only done up till 2012, we need to write off 13, 14, 15, and now 16 now that 2020 is right around the corner and, and being, um, you know, completed. Well, what happens to the liens that we've put on these properties that are uh, so delinquent in their bills when we write so off? We, we leave them on our, on our account. We do not write off the liens um, and we do re um, activate those liens every four years um, with protocol from, from the state and the county. Okay, so even though we're writing this off, do we have some hope of ever collecting some of it? Um, I would say with these, I would say with these accounts, unfortunately, counselor, no. Um, then why do we, why do we take the time to uh, keep the liens? Well, no, the liens are a little bit different. So the liens, I do believe we collect those if and whenever the land or the house sells. Correct. Um, so, so definitely, I, I think we do need to leave the liens on. Um, if at some point we want to move forward with those liens, then we would be looking at foreclosure. Uh, and I'm not sure, we haven't really had that discussion with the counselors if, if that's the direction that we need to go with uh, many of these liens that we do have, uh, you know, to move forward and, and basically get them off of our books, but it would be a foreclosure process. And then of course, the city, you know, turns into owning those houses or that lot. And, you know, then we would need to decide what to do with those. So what's, what's the highest amount uh, on, what's the highest amount owed to us? On a lien or on an account? Yeah, on, on a lien right now. On a lien right now, uh, we do have one account that's about $100,000. We could subtract out finance charges with that, so it would probably get it down to about $80,000. Why would we subtract out finance charges? Uh, again, that would be an option to try and help out the, you know, the owner. Um, I, we've done it both ways in the past, whether we 
write off the finance charges to get the actual um, charges for the services, or um, you know, we we just try and collect the full amount. Well, it seems like we probably need to have a discussion, and perhaps the this committee needs to come up with what our real policy and procedures are because it doesn't really sound like we're completely clear about how we go forward with these. If we have a lien on a property for $100,000, um, it's really not fair to other rate payers that we would just walk away from that and um, not collect anything. Um, who knows when the property may sell, but I just don't think that we're very clear about how we do this um, and what we're being asked to write off. I see on here that, you know, um, we have uh, policies for, um, you know, when a property sells and um, that there's an account receivable on it. And I'm sure that that goes through a title company, but I think that we probably need to, and um, Shannon, I think that's probably up to you to lead that um, review of what our real true policies and procedures are on collecting these monies that are owed to us. Um, I, I, I just, you know, I, I'm always curious as to how we do this in fairness to people that pay their bills. And I'm sure it's hard for some people to pay their bills and it would be easier not to pay them. But um, I'm concerned at the amount of money that we write off, even though I see here that you know, what we write off is lower than the national standard. Um, we don't really have any money right now uh, to write off. So I think it's something that we need to review and to put some time into because we're talking about real money here. We're talking about millions of dollars every time this comes uh, toward us. Um, so Chair, that's a suggestion that I have. Uh, maybe it's not something that this committee supports, but um, I would put it out there as an idea that maybe we should spend some time on this. Thank you, Councilor. Mr. Jones, you have your hand up. Was there something you'd like to add? Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, Councilor Lindell, um, I do appreciate um, the discussion that you're having. Um, I would just point out that, again, as Nancy alluded to, the write-off um, does go back four years. And if you remember, um, I feel uh, we had some very constructive conversations and, um, and direction from the governing body when we did the last write-off. And, and here in Councilor Lindell, um, that resonates with me. So if you would please keep in mind that there were policies and procedures that were modified, implemented, and practiced today um, that would not have an effect on the accounts receivable from 2012. Um, I appreciate your comments on the liens and, um, and we, do, we do manage those and we continue to find um, and look for uh, additional uh, you know, ways to, to pursue that. I think um, one other thing to keep in mind is on the write-off, a majority of the money that's being written off is not substantiated by a lien, mainly because a lien is only filed when the owner of the property is the individual who, um, who owes the money. And so if you'll remember, there was some pretty aggressive policies um, and guidelines that we put from landlord to tenant. When we actually put the account in the tenant's name, um, the landlord thinks that um, they no longer have liability to that. And that may be true, um, but the city did put policies in place where we um, could, could not allow a landlord to transfer the account into the next tenant's name, keeping the liability on the owner of the property, which then does allow us to uh, put liens in place and hold people um, accountable. Uh, so a lot of the write-offs that we're doing now is still remnants of, I would say, this landlord-tenant um, issue that we had that I feel that we've put aggressive measures in place. Uh, we'll continue to look at them and open to conversations about how we do that business. Um, but that's um, that's just what I wanted to add was, was the tenant part, which plays a major role 
in the accounts receivable. Also not writing off the amount. Um, I do agree. Um, we do have aggressive collective measures, um, but what is being written off is what we have determined is like, this is non-collectible and keeping it on our books doesn't make it real money to us um, or to the city. And, and so by getting the write off and having a clean, um, you know, clean fiscal slate um, is actually a better path forward for the utilities. Having sound policies and procedures, how we do business today, um, is how we, we bring in true revenue uh, for the city. But again, thank you, Councilor Lindell. I, I appreciate your, your sentiments. Councilor Lindell, did you have anything else to add? No, thank you. All right. Thank you, Councilor Vihil Kopler. You also pulled this off. Thank you, Chair. Um, I agree this, this, this whole matter needs some discussion uh, just overall and maybe policy making or whatever. But um, back to the write-offs, I recall uh, when Karen Fiorina was still here, we, we did a major write-off then, and, I, and that was after 2017. And I don't know, Ms. Jimenez, if you, uh, I, I know you weren't in the position, but uh, am, I, am, am I recalling that correctly? Um, yeah, Counselor, uh, it was brought to the council um, April of 2017, uh, there was 2.695 uh, uh, and some change uh, written off. Um, and that is when the tenant owner release of liability was modified or was changed. But let me, let me interrupt you just a second, because I, sure. I know, yeah. So, in 2018 was when I was first a counselor. And, and I know it was after I was a counselor that uh, write-offs were brought to us by Karen Fiorina. I mean, not Karen, yeah, Karen Fiorina. <laughs> and um, so I, I don't know if we're missing a piece of data because I know we did write off because there were a lot of questions back then. And that was in 2018, at least 2018. So, uh, I'm just concerned that we're missing a piece of write-off here, which doesn't really, I mean, it just means that there's more money that we've written off. It doesn't really add a whole lot to my, to this issue. Uh, but you might check that because I know we did that. But is, are these write-offs inclusive of refuse, sewer and water or, or is, is it anything, is, is it all of that? It is all of that, uh, in, including uh, stormwater, if there's any stormwater still out there. Okay. Um, so I don't, well, getting back to uh, Shannon Jones's answer, I, I don't think we file liens, but I, you know, I think that's part of the overall discussion we need to have because as a realtor, um, I haven't seen any liens at closing. I've seen money due. Uh, but I haven't seen any liens specifically. And sometimes the buyer is shocked. And so they're so far into the deal that they may agree to pay what's owed. That rarely happens, but um, you know, I, I guess maybe I do have a question and I see Aaron McSherry's on here. And so I wanted to know, do we file liens? Chairman Rivera, Councillor Vigil Coppler, um, we do file liens. I'm not sure if there was more to the question than just that, but I was working on some legislation. Okay. I, I can add to that. We do file liens, Councillor. Um, we do file uh, anywhere between, uh, I don't know, 20 to 36 every month. Um, and we have done that at least for the last six months um, of the year that I've been in this position. So we definitely do file the liens. If the property or the um, title company calls us, we definitely do let them know what the balance is. And we have had several uh, during closing um, pay off that dollar amount so that we can release the lien uh, to the new owner or release it for, you know, for the new owner's uh, processing. Okay, thank you for that. 
Um, you know, I, I brought this up before and, and I, I think uh, I'm just anecdotally speaking, I think uh, generally a lot of times tenants probably do fall in arrears and then they leave. And so they stick the, the owner with the, with the bill. But I just want to share um, in Albuquerque, I own a home in Albuquerque and, and it's not possible to put a tenant's name on a water bill, refuse and sewer. It's not possible. So I'm on the hook, I pay the water and what, regardless of what my tenant does, um, that's the Albuquerque is going to get their money from me. And so if something goes wrong, you know, I'm the one with the lien. I don't have a lien, but I would be the one. So I, I just think that that's a smooth way to do it. And, and uh, it does put more onus on the homeowner on, to, you know, communicate with tenants and to follow up tenants and not just things go up. Um, and, and I know that happens a lot here because I've had some calls friends who are, who are in just about the money that they owe and they say they've paid the, the, the homeowner and the homeowner hasn't paid the water bill. And so now the tenant still owes the same money he already paid to the homeowner. So those disputes too. And um, it just seems like we could, along with Council Dell's suggestion, we wholeheartedly agree a whole discussion about this. It just seems like we could make uh, our, our collections easier if we knock out that one middle person and do have the homeowners responsible for water. Uh, it, to me, it just makes a lot more sense. Um, so is there any reason why we don't do that or why we can't do it? Um, yes, Councillor. Actually, I believe it was in 2004, um, the councillors approved the release of liability to allow the tenants to have that in their name. And um, so I, I, I agree that Albuquerque did not um, allow that change and owners are responsible for the, the utility. However, the city of Santa Fe did not stay on that um, stance and they did allow or did give us direction in utilities to allow the owner to release the liability to tenants. And that's unfortunately kind of where we're at right now is in 2017, when we brought it forward, um, you know, these are, the, these are the issues that we have found now that the owner was allowed to release the liability and at this point, because we, the city of Santa Fe's allowed the release of liability from the owner to the tenant, there is not a way, my understanding, um, to go back and um, always leave it in the owner's name uh, for utilities because we have expanded that and let the tenants, um, you know, get the utility in their name, um, or at least that's the understanding of state law and um, Marcos Martinez's assistance in teaching me that we can't go backwards. We now just hopefully can tighten up um, when we allow um, owners to release balance or release the um, account into a tenant's name. Okay, well, um, I'm, I'm sure that's something that maybe can be brought forward and, and discussed and maybe resolved in some way. Uh, because, Absolutely. You know, in my experience in Santa Fe too, back in the day, I was also a, I also was a landlord here and then the water had to be put in my name. So, um, I mean, you trust people, but I guess you can only trust tenants so much because lives change and, and their circumstances change. Um, so the other question is, now that we're not shutting off water, but we're, you know, we're during the, these COVID times, uh, we're not shutting water off, but we're, we're allowing, I guess, the, the water to continue. And, and naturally the, I'm assuming people are in delinquency, 
is there a plan after COVID for collections? Is there anything on the horizon for how we're going to deal with that? Because that's another looming issue. Uh, yes, it's it's actually a very large, um, unfortunate issue. I, I kind of put that into the, the memo also. Um, we do have, again, our two-day notice. So if and when the moratorium is um, removed or eliminated, um, we will potentially be having to turn off water for accounts um, for those individuals that do have large balances that haven't been uh, keeping up with it. And I know that's very hard with a lot of individuals out of a job and, and not potentially being able to to pay their utilities or rent for that matter. Um, and, and at this point, uh, we don't have a full plan on, you know, are we gonna give them finance charges of a credit? Are we gonna make them um, go on a payment plan? Are they, you know, there, there's so many different options that we potentially can look into um, that is, is just kind of the next steps that we've got to look at is this, Two months out is this six months out is this two years out um you know dealing with covid and not turning water off and i mean there's just so many what ifs um that i, I think it's mind-boggling you know for everyone to to kind of sink their teeth into this we have individuals that owe three and four and you know a thousand dollars just since february and and haven't been able to make a twenty dollar payment let alone you know their monthly payments so I, I have a, a question. You know, I, I happen to call the utility companies uh, for my Albuquerque property today. And while I was on hold, uh, the message, I don't, I think it was the gas company. I'm not sure. Could have been PNM. I think it was a gas company. Anyway, they said, you know, while you're holding, is would you like to, would you would you be um, inclined to offer a payment for someone's gas bill, you know, as a gift. Uh, it, it actually asked that on voicemail. And I thought that was was very, very uh, friendly, you know, as you're waiting the music and all that stuff. I thought that was, was really nice. And, um, you know, it got me to thinking, who do I know that maybe could use a payment of their gas bill? And, and then I got to thinking now, as you were talking about how I think it might be in PNM's bill and you get it and it says, do you want to be a good neighbor and contribute a buck or five bucks or whatever? I mean, do we do that on our utility bills? And maybe now in times of COVID, because we know we're going to have, we have people in distress where we could ask rate payers when they're paying their bills, do you want to contribute to, to a fund for people who can't pay their bills? Is that something we do or could do? Uh, we do not currently, Counselor, we do not currently. Um, I do know that PNM has the uh, Christmas stocking fund or something like that. I can't remember what it's called um, that you can, you know, potentially uh, give money to and then that stocking or that um, money helps out individuals. Uh, the city has not set up or um, we haven't discussed how that would work, um, how or who would manage that money. Um, it, it, I'm sure we would have to get with finance and we would definitely have to get with legal and discuss how, that's, how that would be processed. What we do is we have a list of individual um, churches and nonprofits and other um, entities that we direct um, our customers, if they are having a problem or, you know, issues with paying their utilities. Um, so we do have that type of list, but we do not have a program where we accept over or extra money um, and put it into an account to pay individuals utility bills. Well, it might be worth exploring how the, you know, gas company, PNM, how do they get to, how do they manage these accounts? And, and even if, you know, as in the, the, the message waiting queue that I was in, 
you know, says, do you want to pay somebody else's water bill uh, or as a gift? You know, that that's kind of cool. And and now that I'm thinking of it, the the city of Albuquerque's water bill does have a line where you can contribute something. So uh, they must have a, a way that they do it. And so it, it doesn't hurt to explore this and maybe in Councillor Lindell's suggestion of an, an overview of this whole thing, maybe that's something we can ponder at that time. But I think we're gonna need something or we should be planning something to try to help these ratepayers out of this COVID mess that, that we're all in, but that they particularly find themselves in. I think it's you know a good neighborly gesture. So those are all my questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you for indulging me. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Mr. Jones, you had your hand up uh, initially and then it went down. Did you have something to add or? Uh, not anymore, Mr. Chair. Um, I was uh, just listening to Councillor Veal Coppler um, on our points and um, I take, keep in track of that, but, um, but she answered it as she continued to, to proceed. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Garcia, you also pulled item C. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a lot of the questions I had were asked by my colleagues, um, but I do kind of want to reiterate what Councillor Behill Coppler just said. We do need to start thinking about not if, but but when these the moratorium of not shutting off water ceases, because it will. And I think we need to really start looking at how we are going to start planning for that, um, because you know I'd hate to see some of our community members who have taken advantage of uh, the opportunities that we've, we've put forth of not shutting off the water. And, and then once the water uh, moratorium ceases, they've got a $1,500, $2,000 bill, which puts them in a worse predicament. And I think we've got, really got to start looking at if we're gonna start offering payment plans um, to be Councilor B. Hill Coppler's comments, you know, do we start looking at how we can ask our fellow community members to help one another out, similar to the way we did when, um, you know, when we had to unfortunately furlough some city employees earlier this year, and there was that fund that we put together to help out the employees. I think we need to be looking in that same vein to help out our fellow community members. Um, Ms. Jimenez, do you know in regards to the numbers, and, I, and I, the answer is probably no, but the amount that is owed by tenants versus homeowners? Uh, currently or during the write-off? That's proposed to be written off. I do have a rough estimate right now. Hold on one second. Let me just add the months together. And I think, you know, because this is right in the same vein of Councillor V. Hill Coppler's point of, um, you know, it's unfortunate back in 2004, there was the decision to not keep those utility bills, at least the water bill and the homeowner's name, because now what happens is um, the any outstanding payments, the city gets stuck with. And we there's net kind of no recourse, whereas if it's with the homeowner, there's at least some type of recourse we can look at. That's correct, yes. Um, and, and so am I correct that there is not a way to overturn that 2004 ordinance? Uh, my understanding is there's not a way to overturn it. Um, again, I would... Um, ask Marcos um, for the, you know, for the full legal um, interpretation, but because the city has afforded owners to release the liability, we cannot go backwards is my understanding and leave all accounts in the owner's name. Okay, I, I definitely, I'll reach out to Marcos because that's interesting to me that we, we can't rescind that liability and ensure that it stays with the property owner. Yeah. Mr. Jones, did uh, you have something to add? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I, I feel like maybe there's just a miscommunication. Um, so what put that in place uh, was the city council. And uh, so I do believe that 
and we can defer to the city attorney and work through that, that they can make that change going forward. I think where we're misunderstanding is the city council can't change something now and then I go back on somebody for 12 years of back owed. We can only do what we go forward. And I think the council does have that ability to, to change going forward. Okay. I also want to point out, um, just so it's not lost in the discussion, uh, because again, I did have the, the I was afforded the, the involvement as we went through this last write-off when we did make policy changes. This was part of the discussion um, as we were going forward. Because uh, very easily, I can see how this becomes a, right, a point of issue. It's, it's ingrained in the numbers. And, and it seemed like through that conversation, how we evolved was, um, so again, prior to that write-off, um, release of liability, the accounts went into the tenant's name. Because there was prob problems with that, uh, there was discussion about removing that at the time. And I believe where we ended up landing, what we look like today is um, we do have accounts where landlords have accounts and tenants' names and they're not problematic. The tenants pay their bills and there's not an issue. And so therefore we allow those to remain. Um, where the point of contention comes now is um, if historically or there's multiple offenses where a landlord-tenant relationship is, um, is severed and the tenant leaves the city um, kind of stuck with this accounts payable and the landlord saying, well, it's not mine, is we no longer allow that landlord to put future tenants in the tenant's name. It has to stay with the landlord. Um, I hate to say that um, like problematic ones stay with the landlord. It's just when there's a history of, um, of unpaid revenue by a tenant, um, I guess what I would say is where we're at now is either the landlord has to make the city whole or we don't allow future transfers into the tenant's name, that account has to stay with the landlord. Um, and that's been a, since we've put that in place, that has been a point of contention for the utility. I've said in multiple meetings with multiple landlords um, who, I'm gonna say right, who despise that. Um, but there's a reason why uh, the governing body, I think provided that direction and why our business looks like it is today. It sounds like what you're talking about is the next step in that. But I will point out just having previewed the, the previous conversation is that there were Landlords and tenants where there's there hasn't been an issue and the tenant is is, is a great customer and and we don't um, and, and so we, we allow those to continue to, to happen. But so I just wanted to add that but but, but thank you, Councillor Garcia. Okay, so, so thank you, Mr. Jones. I appreciate that. So what you kind of said is that and to get back to the 2004 ordinance is that we could possibly go back on that, but we couldn't make it retroactive, which I understand we couldn't do, but we could we could go back and change that 2004 ordinance. Is what I thought I heard you say. Uh, yes, sir, I would, again, I would defer to the city attorney's office, but because the governing body created that ordinance, I believe they could change it. Right, that, and that was my thoughts, but I just, you know, I, I'm not the city attorney and that's where I get discussion from Marco, so maybe, Ms. McSherry could possibly elaborate on that. I know she doesn't have uh, too much history on this particular matter, but maybe just just kind of off the top, would that be possible, Ms. McSherry? Chairman Rivera, Councillor Garcia, I think prospectively that makes a lot more sense, um, but you're right, I wasn't here in 2004, so I don't know the full background, but that makes a lot of sense. If we already set up responsibilities, we won't be able to change those going backwards generally, but going forward certainly should be an option. Okay. Awesome, thank you. And the, and and the only Garcia, reason I look, yes, yes, no, Ms. Jimenez. Go ahead, I was, I was just gonna answer your other question about the dollar amount. Um, okay, let, let, let me finish my, my yes. point of train of thought and then we'll get back to that. Yep. Um, you know, and, and the, the only reason I would look at us possibly reverting that 2004 ordinance is, I mean, we're, we're writing off millions of dollars as Councilor Lindell said. I mean, those resources can be invested in affordable housing towards our seniors, towards our youth. Um, it, it can go to various different pots and we're having to write off millions of dollars. I think we really need to look at how we can uh, fix that that challenge that we're seeing right now. Um, so I apologize, Ms. Jimenez. I'll go ahead and let you get back oh, with the numbers. My, my apologies too. So right now, um, anticipation, and this is, this is still getting finalized, um, from 1999 forward through 2016, um, estimated is about $740,000 to be requested um, as a write-off. And what we're finding is anywhere between 68 to 73% is usually tenants 
which is about 518,000 if I do 70%. Um, and again, these are just rough numbers, um, but that would be um, you know, a significant amount of um, proof, I guess you could say, of what uh, we go through, unfortunately, with, with um, tenants. Okay. Thank you. I think that was at least my kind of suspicion. And thank you for somewhat confirming that. I appreciate that. Um, I have no other questions on the matter, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Councillor Beta. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to remind the members of the governing body that we have a connect program with community services and one of their their charges is to assist residents when it comes to not only housing, but utility issues they may be having. And so before we go off and start recommending that we include this in a bill or this on a, on when somebody's on hold, maybe what we do need to do is uh, talk more about the connect program and the different services that that provides. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Good idea. Uh, any other uh, questions? All right, because even though it's only an update because it was on the consent calendar, we still need some action on it. So what are the wishes of the committee? Move to approve. Second. A motion for approval and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, could we have a roll call please, Ms. Pasula? Chairman Christopher Rivera. Yes. Councilor Romana Beta. Yes. Councilor Joanne Vijo Coppler. Yes. Councillor Michael Garcia. Yes. Councillor Signe Lindell. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. We're on to item G. Um, Councillor Lindell, there were some changes uh, that Mr. Romero put out earlier. Uh, would you like him to discuss those or do you want to just get into your questions? No, I, I, I just... Um, Two things. Um, when you get a chance, Mr. Romero, will you forward to all the members of the governing body the memo uh, on the CIP and the ICIP list and how different items go on to those and where their placement on them, um, what that means uh, to the projects on the list? Um, Mr. Chair, Councilor Rendell, um, I haven't had a chance to prepare that. I, I, I get it. It's just so, a friendly so, reminder. Okay, so um, I'll definitely uh, look into that. And then if uh, you want, I can give a, just a quick uh, presentation, not over what I did before, but just uh, where we're at with this list and, and what we're looking, what major decisions we're looking for from you guys at this point. Um, Chair, do you have an objection to that? I only have one other question. I'm happy to hear Mr. Romero's presentation, and then I have one question. All right, John, why don't you give us an update on uh, what's going on with the list and the changes to the top five? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, we, th this past couple of weeks, we've been working uh, primarily with the the list from last uh, last year, updating the numbers in in these projects. So we're still working on that, um, updating cost estimates, thing like things like that. So as we move on through finance and council, some of the numbers within these projects may change a bit, and it's more just uh, nailing down exactly how much we have in each of these projects, as well as uh, what the total project cost. It is currently uh, based on our current cost estimates. Um, the main thing that we're looking for at this point is to make sure, one, that we have uh, every project, uh, the projects on the list that the districts themselves are looking to put as a district priority. And I'll, I'll be looking to set up here pretty, uh, pretty soon a meeting with district counselors to go over their priorities so that, um, so that, that's one thing to make sure if a priority that you have is not on this list, that we get it on this list. And then secondly, what Councilor Rivera um, explained is to um, start discussions and gain a consensus on the top five uh, priorities within the list. 
if I can, um, I, I'll uh, show you what those are right now. I know those were sent to you, but just if I could share my screen just so we can look at them. The top five uh, that we have right now, and this is different than what was presented last year. So this is after meeting with uh, the city manager and the mayor to, to kind of give it our first brush um, to uh, provide our, our top five and then again, discuss it. Um, backing up, if I may, uh, Councillor, I do want to answer some questions that were uh, brought up at the um, at the last public works committee meeting. It'll help us provide context for for these decisions uh, moving forward. Um, so uh, first of all, you know, I, I did talk to to Mark, and, and he may be able to join us here shortly um, regarding the um, what kind of money we can expect this year. And what he's thinking is somewhere in the one to $2 million range of total funding to the city. Um, that includes money that goes towards city priorities as well as money that goes to the district priorities. Um, to understand what that split will be between district and uh, city priorities, you know, it's, we don't have that exact number, although definitely more money goes towards the city priorities typically. In my experience here during lean times, district priorities will receive anywhere from 25,000 to maybe 100,000, but typically they're down in the 25 to $50,000 range in my experience. Um, so with that being said, you know, I think as far as city priorities, um, depending on which ones we, we move forward, there's a good likeliness that maybe only, maybe our top two priorities would be funded Again, depending on, on, on how we establish the, those priorities. Um, um, there was a question about can, um, can we seek money for utility improvements? Um, the answer is yes. Although uh, through uh, Mark's experience, um, that's never really been terribly successful. Uh, people have not been successful in receiving money for those type of purposes, but it is eligible and can be uh, lobbied for if, if that is the, the desire of the council. Excuse me one second, I'm going through my notes here. Um, we, um, you guys also did ask us to come up with a, uh, a list that shows by district, as well as how much uh, money we've had thus far. And I, um, we are working on that. I, I didn't want to present it quite yet because um, I wanted to make sure I had not only the districts right, but the numbers right in, in, that, in that presentation. I'm hoping to have that ready by finance, but I can definitely go over to the districts and the funding that's been acquired for at least the top five priorities. I do that, have that information available. As far as, um, as themes, you know, there, I personally think that, you know, definitely COVID is going to be a theme. And I think being able to have, um, as, well as, as well as what the new norm will be coming out of COVID might be a theme of, of what kind of priorities we would like to look at. Um, so with that in mind, as well as when this money is available, again, um, this money would be available to spend roughly a year after it's appropriated by the legislature, roughly in, or a year after the legislative session starts, so roughly January of 2022. So keeping that in mind, um, this is the logic behind these top five priorities. Uh, the Southside Teen Center, um, it, um, it's already received uh, legislative funds. Um, to date, the number that I have that we've received thus far is uh, $5,010,000. Uh, and so um, we, um, I, I know uh, the, uh, this isn't consistent with it, um, the, the list I have in front of you guys. So we will be updating that number to be consistent with what those numbers are. Um, the reason this uh, could be considered a priority is first, you know, on its own merits, it, um, I, I know um, the purpose of this project is to try to provide a facility for uh, needs that are underserved in a certain, on a part of town that probably needs these needs more than any part of town, other part of town. It's where uh, a, prominent, a lot of our teens live in this side of town and having a teen center uh, available would be helpful. The COVID spin on this 
is um, when we come out of this pandemic, I think one of the priorities that could be conceived is uh, re-engaging our teens in activities they were in pre-COVID and social activities uh, and productive uh, social activities. And I think this teen center is crucial, is key in that effort. So um, once we come out of this pandemic to have a facil facility like that available uh, for that effort, I think uh, could be, uh, would be helpful. Um, the next one was the airport. Um, right now, the numbers I'm showing that we've received for the airport expansions this far is uh, about $12.3 million. Um, the, uh, the COVID spin on this is, um, you know, coming out of the pandemic is uh, revitalizing our, our economy, especially our local economy. Um, we think the airport is, is key in that effort. Um, right now, we are getting ready to go out to bid for the parking lot expansion. Um, and we are beginning uh, the design efforts of the terminal expansion. Um, I think furthering those terminal expansion er efforts to make our airport more functional um, could, could definitely help to the local economy. So um, that was uh, the, um, the determination, the uh, justification for the airport being number two. Uh, number three, uh, median beautification. You know, we know um, the condition of our medians comes up quite a bit. Um, the mayor has mentioned uh, uh, the efforts of the SWAT uh, committee that's come together with different ideas on how to not only improve our, our medians, but to make them less uh, labor intensive uh, with regards to, to maintenance. So um, I think the benefit of, of this project is even if we get a small amount of money, you can still do feasible projects versus you know, a big scale project. If, if you don't get a, a good chunk of funding, you can't do anything. This one, any kind of money you get, you can, we could always uh, spend towards medians. Um, COVID spend I have on this is, you know, of course with our economy, uh, the way it's in and our staffing, the way it's in, um, making improvements to this type of infrastructure would definitely help, um, help us uh, to, uh, repurpose our limited resources to other areas, uh, primarily uh, active park space, um, which uh, is a segue into the next one, uh, city park renovation and repairs. Um, I think not only now, but after COVID, um, just having uh, these open spaces not only helps uh, with, with overall uh, activities uh, for everybody, including teens, um, but it provides facilities that are um, where uh, social distancing is capable. So um, this goes into that actual infrastructure, whereas the previous one um, helps us free up uh, staff to help us maintain that infrastructure. Uh, the last one we put here was fire station number two. Um, it, um, you know, it, it has a public safety uh, it, it, it is public safety. Um, we did uh, temper or put, put off uh, funding that um, with this last GRT bond as part of the operating budget. We're going to be looking to spend that on on operating type expenses, capitalizable. Although, um, so you know this this project, um, you know it could be that that we decide to try to fund it with our next bond sale. But anyways, um, any kind of money for that could help supplement that effort. Um, after that, everything after that, um, I've mentioned this before, but I just want to reiterate it, um, is just where it falls in the list. So for instance, Midtown infrastructure, although it shows a rank number six, it's really of equal ranking as Paseo Sol extension um, and further on down the line. Um, one last thing um, in looking at all this, you know, again, trying to, uh, um, uh, maximize our resources, we were definitely making an effort and not creating new projects, um, especially since we have a lot of ongoing projects that, that I feel we need to get completed. So not only from a staff standpoint, but from a funding standpoint. Um, with that, I stand for questions. Um, I should be able to provide uh, general information for uh, some of the other projects if you have questions regarding them and regarding what their purposes are. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, Councilor Lindell, you still have the floor. Thank you. Um, 
actually, Mr. Romero answered my question in his presentation. Um, I wanted to talk about the priorities of our top five. Um, you know, my concern with this is all, most of our top five are so um, intensive money-wise and with the amount of money, um, you could look at it, the amount of money that we're going to get and the amount of money that we're not going to get. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to see us um, have projects that we can get some traction in. I don't think that getting, um, didn't you say, John, that you thought, uh, or I'm talking to Mark, that we were looking at maybe a million dollars total, one to two million total? Yes, one to up to up to two million dollars, and also Mark's available um, if you guys do have any questions uh, that you you would like him to answer. Um, you know, I just see these projects amount not yet funded, like the fire station over. Uh, eight million dollars um the airport 10 million uh teen center four million i mean we're not even going to get close on those um i would be inclined to try to switch up some of the order of this so that um you know like you said john uh the median project you know, um, if we got a half a million or three quarters of a million dollars, we could we could make um, we could get some traction and, and make some changes on that that would make a difference. Same with the park renovation and repairs. These other projects are so big that for me, I would be inclined to uh, put them off to another day when we thought that there was uh, a much larger pot of money available because I think that you know you can you can get a million or two million on a project that's a 10 million dollar project and you still aren't really moving ahead on it and we end up not spending money that's been allocated to us which it's my understanding that that's problematic so I'll yield the floor those are just my comments on it uh, welcome to the meeting Mark Uh, thank you, uh, Miss Wheeler. I see your hand up. Uh, is there something you'd like to add to that? I would. Thank you so much, Chairman. Um, and uh, on Councilor Lindell's point, it's it's a really important one. Um, the reason that actually a little bit of money could go a long way on the Southside Teen Center and Airport Terminal, the Southside Teen Center is actually funded at five million. So that that funded to date column is incorrect, and we are moving full steam ahead right now on a design and construction of that project. So. Um, and it's likely to need just a little bit, you know, when we go out to bid, it always has that, you know, like 10% over thing. So a little bit could help on that. And the airport terminal expansion as well is on full steam ahead on a, a phased um, expansion approach that does use um, the 11.3 million that we have, but again, would probably uh, use a little bit more well. So we're a little further along on those projects and, and actually funded to what we think both of those projects is a is a constructible phase approach on both of them. Thank you, uh, Mr. Duran. Um, are you able to to actually speak and get on? Yes. Can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Duran. Um, would you like to add anything or give us? Uh, I don't know if you heard John's presentation. Uh, if you had anything to add to that. I did share John's uh, presentation, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I apologize for that, but uh, even if I'm a little bit repetitive, if you don't mind, can I just give you my perspective coming into the legislative session in terms of themes, availability of money, et cetera? Sure. Okay. Um, uh, it's nice to be with you all. Um, um, and sorry if some of this is repetitive. I, I did have some good conversations with John leading up to this. And uh, one of the things that I, I want to emphasize is that um, everyone knows the state's financial situation, right? Well, that financial situation 
is predicated on lack of uh, uh, general operating uh, revenues. Uh, the traditional capital outlay source of funds that has always come to the New Mexico legislature for spending. And in, and in the old days, it's all there ever was. The interest earned off the severance tax permanent fund uh, under the constitution says that it will be used to fund capital outlay projects in the state of New Mexico. That's always been available and it's going to be available this year. Well, that then gets diminished a little bit along the way, right? Because of legislation that has been enacted the last several years, 5% immediately goes to the tribal infrastructure uh, fund. 500% of it immediately comes off the top and goes to the Colonias Fund. But the base traditional uh, uh, severance tax, uh, tax interest money is going to be available this year. Now, is it going to be down? It's going to be down. I think it's probably going to be in the neighborhood of $140 million. Are we going to have what has been used for capital outlay in past legislative sessions when we had revenue boons? And that was the legislature saying, we don't want to use excess money into uh, operating uh, fund where it will be considered recurring. So we're going to use it for capital outlay. Will that source of money be available this legislative session? No. So there will be capital outlay money. And so then the question is, but there's going to be less than we've seen in the last several years. So what are some of the, the, the good themes to approach uh, with? Uh, and, and I always, you know, my clients always ask me for a fill of a number. I have a fill of a number of uh, one to two million dollars. With that one to two million dollars, uh, we'd want to ask for a citywide priority. Why not try that for a citywide priority that fits? In talking to John and, and, and others, and you are all the decision makers, we're just the ones to suggest this, but the suggestion is go ahead and try this citywide project, which is the teen center. It has had tremendous support. We've gotten big chunks of money along the way. Even if it's a continuity of strategy and a continuity of, of rhythm, if you will, in terms of one of the two big projects we've been asking for in the past to have some consistency, and that's been the teen center and the airport, Let's try it for the teen center. In terms of the airport, I just don't see it. It, it, it. You mention the airport to any legislator and there's a big gasp, right? Because they think some $15 million figure is coming and because that's what it's been. So, and, and besides, we, we have some money that has been built up to spend from past legislative sessions. So have a strategy where uh, we're thinking about one citywide priority palatable number, Southside Teen Center. It can be used as Regina just talked about. And then knowing that if we have to shift and it's not, you know, it's, it's we're gonna come out with $800,000 or something like that, then have the, this, this uh, I would suggest, you have a consistent set of then district priorities that have a theme. Uh, maybe district priorities would have a theme of transportation. Maybe district priorities would have a theme of infrastructure. Where that's going to help is to always make sure that you have enough uh, 250 to $350,000 projects and under uh, in your arsenal and on your ICIP to work with. I think where people make mistakes is they only submit five projects in their ICIP and they don't have, they can submit so much more. And then we have this arsenal to work on in terms of what theme develops um, or what themes is popular in the moment. I, I've never, the only theme I've gotten a, a feel for quite frankly is, is COVID. And I think um, uh, there's a little bit of an error in thinking that, you know, COVID is going to be funded by the legislature because the legislature, and it's so, certainly going to be a priority, but uh, I think legislators are going to be thinking, well, cities and counties already got the loan, but, you know, access to loan money. Uh, uh, they got the CARES Act money and things like that. And so overall, there, there's my suggestion that there'll be, there, in, in comments, there'll be capital outlay money. Think about one to two million, still think about it from the perspective of a citywide priority. 
be flexible with then other uh, uh, projects to accumulate maybe towards 1 million. Um, I would suggest thinking of it in, in district priorities and district priorities with a theme. Thank you, Mr. Uh, <laughs> was that a ramble? <laughs> that was good, thank you, Mark. So uh, John mentioned that there would be really, that in the list, there's no difference between number six and number 30. What about the top five? I, I, even the, the top five, I think, uh, Mr. And Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. I think the top five, I think the top five are important because it's still, it, because it's conveying your real three to five year master plan. And so you, with your top five, you're really saying, here's what our priorities are this year. And we've done enough proper planning to already let you know what our priorities are gonna be next year and the year thereafter. And we're not willy nilly doing this. We're, that's gonna be consistent because this is a well thought out three to five year master plan. That's, that's where I think the top five are important. And then after that, it doesn't matter. John is correct. There, there is no difference between six and 30. All right, thank you. Uh, Council Lindell, I'll still uh, give you the floor in case you have any questions now that Mark. Uh, no, I'll yield right now. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Duran. Uh, Councilor Vigil Coppler, you also pulled this item. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Duran, for your overview. Uh, what I was going to ask, and, I, and I'm glad to hear you say is, I think it's really important with the legislature to be consistent. And if, and if we were talking teen center and the airport before, it doesn't hurt to continue that dialogue because we do have legislators, as you know, who are like honed in on a particular project and then they, ex they expect you to come back and, and still fight for that project because that's one that might be dear to their heart. Um, I know we got a lot of traction. I don't know that we got that much money, but we got a lot of traction with the airport. And, and, and I'm just using that as an example, but going back to some of the other things that we brought forward last year were sidewalks. And uh, I remember a conversation we had with Senator Rodriguez where, you know, she, she said, we really wanted to get the sidewalks, but, but you know, we, I, we just had to give it up for, for a trade-off, you know? So how do you suggest that we carry that dialogue, even though, you know, we know we are not gonna get all the money, but we still have to, to, to pitch our, our goals so that they don't forget about them. Because I think we lobby for this year because there's so little money. We're, we're really lobbying and making an impact for the following year so that we can stress what our objectives are and our goals and what's important to the city. So, um, you know, not all legislators want to talk about the same things. And that's kind of goes back to my point about what projects they really want to see. So um, I don't know how you feel about that kind of thing. Um, I don't always think it's a good idea to keep switching around because then it seems like we were just throwing up the, the balls to juggle and, and really didn't care which one fell first. Is your question for Mr. Duran? Yes. Uh, Councillor, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and Councillor, I, I think you make a good point. And I, I think it was consistent with uh, what the chairman asked in terms of uh, priorities one through five. I think it is important to stay consistent and that is why those priorities one and five uh, 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 should be well thought of because it's the themes that we carry forward. And I can already you know, think of the nomenclature that we'd be using at least in regard to the uh, top two, right? And maybe even the top three. Uh, uh, top priority, say you were to say, it would be the teen center. It'd be top priority is the teen center. Uh, one of the reasons that the top priority this year isn't the, uh, 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 in terms of what we're asking all the legislators to fully fund, because there's going to be so little money, let's, let's fund as much as we can towards one uh, uh, project. 
the airport is still a tremendous priority, but we have $11 million that's accumulated from last legislative session or, or prior. Um, here's our spend down plan. And so they, they become engaged, right? They become engaged with the project, but it's not necessarily an ask, but by talking about the spend down plan and the timing of that, it sets us up back again to be at the airport next year if you make that a top priority. If the Southside Teen Center is then closer to being completed and we're saying the next increment of that gets us that much closer to com uh, completion, we're also then using that lineage to then already make a case to complete it next uh, legislative session. And so I think for both of those, the, the sell of it is, easy, is, is much easier because of how consistent we have been on those two projects. So I definitely keep those in the, in the top five. And then at the third, if you tell me what elevates, if it's the Midtown campus, whatever's third, we haven't probably been talking about that as much as we've been talking about the airport and Southside Teen Center, we, we would then make that a priority. And we'd start the, the sound nomenclature in regard to that. It's education this year. It's maybe a, a, a smaller ask the next year, but then it sets us up for in year three, that that may be our number one priority. I, I, I think you're on the right track in thinking of it that way and consistency. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, the, the next two things, um, well, just looking at the priorities, Mr. Chair, uh, I, I happen to think that citywide park renovations is more important than medians because our children don't play on medians. I mean, if they're nice to look at and they're pretty and I think they're important, but uh, we've been inundated with constituent calls about the, the lack of uh, maintenance of our parks and children getting hurt with bad equipment and needles and, and all that kind of stuff. And so I, I happen to think that parks uh, renovation and repairs is probably more important. And of course, you know, it meets, uh, Councillor Lindell's test of small dollars. So that, I think that's, that's more important to me. Uh, and then the, the next thing is I would like to sponsor your resolution, Mr. Chair. So those are, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councillor Garcia, you also pulled this item. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chair. Just quick question of clarification. Um, the number one priority is the teen center on the list. Um, it's got 2.1 million funded to date, but didn't the, it just received nearly a 3.9 million allocation at the legislature this year? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, um, Councillor, that is correct. Um, again, we still are working through, through all the numbers. Um, so far, what my, my record shows we've received to date $5,010,000. Okay, so then that, so if we receive 5 million, then we roughly only need 1.1 more million to meet the total cost. And so that would greatly change the request of 4 million. John, yeah. do you wanna? Um, yeah, if you please give me one second here. Okay, um, yes, yeah, so it, it would knock, uh, I might need some help from Regina on this one. I believe um, even with that total of $5 million, we still are underfunded. And so receiving an extra, yes, about $1 million to fully fund it. Although that's, um, I personally think based on um, the way our projects are always underfunded, if we received even more than that, it could um, it could definitely be used towards the project. Okay, and and I'm not. I, I think we just want to get our numbers in line, especially when we're going to the legislature to act, ask them when we say it's going to cost us X amount, and we're asking for more than a, that amount. Doesn't necessarily lead to a great ask, in my opinion. So, I think if if we're expecting it to cost six point one. Um, I think that's what we should be asking now for the in addition to and that when we run into those challenges where 
I agree. We probably will be, we're, we're shooting ourselves a little low. Uh, maybe we do then need to revise that 6.1 million figure to what we feel is the best projection. Because I don't want us to be in a space where we get what our projection is and then we go back to the legislature and say, well, we gave you what you thought you needed. Yeah, I, th I think you're correct. And I think uh, John said they needed to rework those numbers on the teen center, so. Okay, awesome. That's all I had. I just wanted some clarification on the numbers, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, any other uh, questions? All right, so I'm, I'm fine with this list. If we, you know, change uh, parks with medians, I think that's fine. Um, the only one that, um, so before we move on, John, if you can just, so anytime we add a project, I know there's a small booklet that goes along with it. So it's not just a matter of putting a number in, in your spreadsheet and putting it on a list. Can you tell us what goes into actually getting it. I know there's, again, a small booklet that goes with uh, each uh, item that comes up. You're on mute, John. Yes, Mr. Chair, sorry about that. I can show you an example of one of those. So, you know, let me get, let me get you a better example. I was gonna pull up, um, let me pull up a project that we've been discussing. Yeah, bear with me. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just going through a bunch of emails. So here we go. So um, this isn't what we're discussing, but it'll give you an example of what it looks like. So right here, um, these are the forms that are generated, the ones that we enter in have all this information just in a slightly different format, but um, each project takes, when it's all said and done, um, creates all this, this information right here. And yes, so entering that information into the database, it is very laborious. And again, I, I do apologize that these numbers aren't, um, Exactly right. Again, what, what I was trying to emphasize my efforts on this week is to come up with a prioritization and start entering in uh, what correct numbers we had into the system so we could start um, getting that stuff in in time for our deadline. Um, one last thing, if, if I may, uh, Mr. Chair, I can let you know the format that, that we entered it in and I can get that for you really quick. Again, this what I'm showing you here is the form that the um, the DFA system spits out. And then this next one is the form that we entered in. And then the forms have to be updated every year, correct? All 60 items or so? Every year, that is correct. So um, here we go. Uh, new share. Um, are you seeing this new screen I have right here that says, um, Starts off with project information on the top? Yes. Okay, yeah, so this is, is the form. It's 10 pages worth of entering in, checking boxes, and this is what we have to do for, uh, for each project, putting in the scope of work, justification, what kind of mo money we're looking for, um, the different phases, breaking up uh, the project by phases, whether it includes different types of studies, right away acquisition, design, what years we're planning on doing each of those, so um, it is a, a high level planning effort, but it is, um, it does take some time to, to do. All right, thank you, John. Um, any other questions? All right, so uh, I'll entertain a, a motion. And uh, again, I think uh, the list looks pretty good as is. I think the medians and the park do meet the level of uh, small project monies that Councilor Lindell was talking about. So. You know, if there's a hundred thousand dollars available, um, we can use that towards. Uh, it can go a long way towards funding a park or doing something in the median. So, 
I think we kind of have both our bases covered uh, with regards to what uh, Mr. Duran said. So, uh, but I'll entertain a motion from the committee. Mr. Chair, um, Councilor, are you, are you, you said a while ago you were you would move forward switching medians and parks. Yes, if that's what uh, if that was a, a big concern of yours, I I don't have a problem with it. So I'll make a motion to uh, approve this with, with making that change. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second it. So a motion and a second. Any uh, further discussion? All right, see none. Can we have a roll call, Ms. Pasula? Chairman Christopher Rivera? Yes. Councilor Roman Abeta? Yes. Council um, Joanne V. Hill Coppler? Yes. Councilor Michael Garcia? Yes, and I would like to be added as a co sponsor, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And uh, Councilor Signe Lindell? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Pasilla. So we'll have uh, another shot at this. Does this still have to go to finance, uh, John? Mr. Chair, yes, the schedule will go to finance next and then on to city council. Okay, so we'll have another look at it if uh, finance makes any changes and uh, we can look at it at council as well. Thank Mr. you all Chair. very much. Mr. Chair. Councilor Vijo Copper. Um, I just, I, had, I asked way early on if I, saying that I wanted to be a co-sponsor did did anybody catch that? Uh, yeah, I think we heard it. Uh, Ms. Pasula, did you make note of that? I did, Mr. Chair, and I'll reach out to the legislative office to inform them of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Duran, for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, now let's move on to item I, uh, which is pulled by Councilor Hill Coppler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, the only question I have on this is, I didn't find uh, any of the old fees on any of the documentation. Maybe there aren't any. Maybe these are all new. I don't know. So uh, that's that is my only question. I'd just like to see what the do you have a comparison the old fees, new fees. Uh, Mr. Isaacson, I believe, is on. If he wants to answer Ooh, or comment um, on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Councilor V. Hill Coppler. Um, I'm actually going to defer that to uh, Assistant Land Use Director Jason Kloop. Um, he's been leading the effort on this project for the Land Use Department. And then I just would also like to mention that we also have uh, Planning Manager Noah Burke on the line. Uh, he has some good uh, historical perspective on the fees being with the department as long as he's been. So um, I'll defer first to Jason uh, to answer that. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, Councilors, uh, Councilor uh, Vio Coppler. So, in the I apologize in the the packet that went out originally, uh, there is a proposed uh, land use and planning fee table uh, that was not included, but we did include that. Uh, I asked Emily to provide that early this morning, so you should have it in your digital document. If you have that, I'd like uh, to turn your attention to that. Um, it does list all the new fees highlighted in green and all the current fees that are unhighlighted and then fees that have either increased or decreased are highlighted in um, yellow and blue respectively. So uh, thank you. There's, and this is sideways. So <laughs> uh, I, uh, I was uh, wondering if, if you didn't have anything that's just like side by side like fee A and it, it's, we're proposing this fee and this is the old fee. Uh, Councilor Villacopler, no, I, I apologize. We haven't formatted it that way, but I'm happy to provide that to the committee. Well, it, I mean, I don't know how hard that would be. I know this seems like it's an Excel spreadsheet or something, but it would just be a little bit easier to analyze. That would be helpful. Is it okay if they provide that before uh, before it goes to council? Yes. Is that something you can do, Jason? Yes, sir. Thank you. 
Great, and I would send it to the entire committee as well. Any other questions? What are the wishes of the committee? Move to approve. Second. Motion for approval by Councilor Lindell, second by Councilor Beta. Any further discussion? We have a roll call, please, Ms. Pistola. Chairman Christopher Rivera. Yes. Councilor Romana Beta. Yes. Councilor Joanne V. Hocopler. Um, I'll abstain till I see the data. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Michael Garcia. Yes. Councilor Signe Lindell. Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. Uh, next we're on item J, uh, which is also pulled by Councilor V. Hocopler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I was, I was just curious about this. Um, um, I was just wondering what, what precipitated this. Um, is there a, a need, and 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 maybe someone could tell me what the need is for a uh, kitchen. Uh, I don't know if Councillor Lindell wants to speak to it. It's uh, her bill. Um, if not, we can let uh, Mr. Isaacson try. Mr. Isaacson, why don't you go ahead? Yes, thank you. So this was um, brought to us by um, two constituents, Hillary Kilpatrick and Andrea Beatty. Um, they are interested in opening a commercial kitchen or a commissary kitchen um, at a property that's located within a C1 district. And that is what initiated this. Uh, they, I believe, first approached councilors uh, Lindell and Villarreal and then came to the land use department asking for this text amendment. Um, I think I would say that there is a need for this. Um, I, you know, commercial kitchens, commissary kitchens are um, wonderful economic uh, development engines. Uh, they allow people to produce foods and agricultural products for sale at places like a farmer's market. Um, other places that sell food. And then it, oftentimes they act as incubators where someone who starts say, making salsa on a small scale to sell at the farmer's market, uh, that becomes a very popular item. Uh, and they scale up and they may have to you know, open up an industrial kitchen uh, that would allow them to produce something on the scale of say Sadie's or something like that. So these are actually, we currently don't have any commissary kitchens. Uh, we don't have this use defined in our land use code. And I think um, this is a very interesting proposal and one that does fill a hole in our economic landscape. Okay, um, thank you. I, I just thought it was kind of a novel idea. And I, since I didn't have a whole lot of information except what's here, uh, maybe I can ask, um, I thought, and maybe it is still, uh, where, where someone, you know, some entrepreneur could, had a, bought a building Put a, put a kitchen in there and rented it out. Is that what this is? That's exactly okay. what it is, Councillor. So okay. it's a place where, um, let's say you, you would use it for, you would rent it out for a period of time, whether it be an hour or a couple of hours, uh, you would have access to the kitchen to produce your, uh, your food, whether it be something for sale, like a salsa or something like that. Or um, often these facilities are used by operators and owners of food trucks. Um, where they produce their food, uh, load it on the food truck, and then use the food truck more as a, a vending uh, facility, more so than a, a food preparation facility. So uh, these are actually increasingly common. Uh, we don't, uh, City of Santa Fe doesn't currently have any commissary kitchens. However, there is a commissary kitchen in house, and there's another one in Albuquerque, and I think they've shown to be very uh, successful and important to the economic landscape. Well, I recall something coming before the council, maybe it was even before me, my time, but where there was an idea to use the convention center kitchen, something like this. Uh, is that possible under this? So I'm not aware of that proposal. Um, I believe- I could speak to that. I'll yield the floor to Councillor Lindell. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, there were there are three kitchens in the convention center, uh, and one of them, uh, 
about three or four years ago, I'm sure Councillor Rivera remembers clearer than I do, but we did bring forward and turn that into a community kitchen also, which is available for rent on a short-term basis. And um, there are people that uh, rent it for say two hours, uh, three days a week to prepare for whether it's their food truck or currently there's a gentleman that rents it every week for a certain amount of time for um, making pizza dough for a food truck down on uh, Cerritos Road. So yes, the convention center does in fact have a community kitchen and um, I think that's what you were asking. That, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Isaacson. I thought, that, I thought that had failed though, but I guess I'm wrong. Okay, um, so, so Mr. Isaacson, what is required to, to get the permit within 200 feet of a residence? What, what are your criteria? So the requirements, thank you for the question, uh, Councilor Vino Coppler, uh, Mr. Chair. The requirements for a special use permit are listed um, in chapter 14. Um, let's see I, if I have that information handy. Um, if you bear with me for one second, I can uh, pull that up. Um, here we go. It's They're listed in uh, chapter 14-3.6 and um, there are the procedures are we ask for a site plan, an application. Uh, those are given to the Board of Adjustment for review. Um, and the necessary findings to grant a special use permit is that the Land Use Board has the authority under the section of Chapter 14 describing the application to grant a special use permit. Uh, the special use permit does not adversely affect the public interest and the use and any associate buildings are compatible with and adaptable to building structure and the uses of letting the property and other properties in the vicinity of the premises under consideration. So a little background on why we included the special use requirement in this bill. Um, there's always the chance that food production might uh, create some um, unwanted uh, externalities, whether it be odors or smells or something like that. And so we wanted the option of making sure that um, commissary kitchens in close proximity to residential areas, we have a chance to review uh, what they'll be doing in that kitchen and ensure that there's no negative impacts on the surrounding neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, does, does it, is there anywhere there, since this apparently is new, for uh, getting a certification from the health department or is, is there something like that, like restaurants have to do? Absolutely. I'm not exactly 100% uh, sure of what those requirements are. I do know that any uh, commercial kitchen does go through uh, quite a bit of scrutiny in terms of inspection for health and other safety factors. And um, I'm sure that they, uh, the operators of the, the commissary kitchen will also uh, be uh, very mindful of any health regulations in terms of their uh, people that they're renting out space to. Well, then, then my question is on, on the permit requirements, shouldn't they have that as part of their approval process to get a permit that they have uh, permission from, you know, I guess it would be the environmental department to operate? Um, so I think it's, I think the question is more about uh, the proper order of operations. So first you would have um, the permit from us to develop your property in such a way as to open a commissary kitchen. And then once you have done the either new construction, renovation, whatever it might be, that facility would then be inspected by NMEB uh, and given a certificate that would allow them to then operate out of that facility. And, and that's in the rules now? Um, those are those aren't in our thing for the question. Those aren't in our rules um, governing commissary kitchen. Those are more in uh, the regulations governing the operation of any food service establishment uh, in the city. Okay, so I mean, the reason for my questioning is I would just be concerned about cleanliness and you know meeting those standards. Okay. Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair, uh, Councilor Vihal Cobbler. Absolutely, um, these. 
these commercial kitchens are held to the same standard that any commercial food production facility is held to, whether it be a commercial kitchen, a restaurant facility, uh, anything along those lines, this will be uh, required to uh, operate at the same level of, of health and safety and sanitation. Okay, thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Any other questions? What are the wishes of the committee? I'll move to approve. Second. Motion for approval by Councilor Lindell, second by Councilor Vigil Coppler. Any further discussion? See none, can we have a roll call vote please, Ms. Pissola? Chairman Christopher Rivera? Yes. Councilor Romana Beta? Yes. Councilor Joanne Vigil Coppler? Yes. Councilor Michael Garcia? Yes. Councilor Sigmund Lindell? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Pasula. Uh, we're on our last item, uh, item M, um, which is pulled by uh, Councilor Vigil Coppler. I think everyone's seen this at least once, maybe twice. So let's just jump into questions. Uh, Councilor Vigil Coppler, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure uh, how to, I, I'm sure some of the, the things I'm gonna discuss will probably lead to questions, but, uh, and if all of you have, have seen this before, maybe you've asked them. Uh, so I'm gonna just have you indulge what I have to, to say. I, I am not aware uh, specifically about the details that went into planning the reorganization and um, so maybe I, I'll just start by some preliminary comments. And that is, you know, that uh, when you reorganize and undertake a, a major, I consider this to be a major reorganization. And, and in my experience, when I've been involved in reorganizations, you follow a, a lengthy process. And that process could be uh, anywhere from, depending on the size of the organization, creating uh, focus groups designed to solicit information from employees at the lowest level, all the way up to the department directors, and in our case, even the city council. Um, and, and then because this seemed to pop up during the time when we're pretty much all on shutdown, uh, I wasn't, I have not been aware of, nor was I invited to any kind of focus group or uh, solicitation of ideas, uh, comments on proposals, uh, anything like that. And, and it seems to me that when you do that and you involve people in decisions that are going to affect them, especially in the workplace and doing the work, you learn uh, a, a great deal about what people really do. And since they're engaged at the lowest level, uh, I have found that employees have a lot to say about uh, what their ideas are, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, and so, you know, then you, you begin to get them involved. Uh, I think employees support what they help to create. But the, the point being that you involve all kinds of uh, employees and then of course other stakeholders outside the organization, but I'm just dealing with this right now. And that is that you, you communicate throughout the organization and focus on uh, that you, you're, you're getting all the steps that are involved. And, and I believe a, that communication should be a two-way street. So, um, I think this is kind of like my first paragraph of thought. And so I'm not sure uh, who will answer the question. Maybe Jarrell, if she's on, I think she is, yes. And, and that is, what, how did you engage employees on this reorganization down to the bottom level across departments, divisions, sections, and then of course the employees who are the front line uh, in, in these COVID times, and, and how did you do that? Mr. Chair, Councilor Viho Coppler, thank you for the question. Um, and I would like to say, I think this is um, actually a very long process. Uh, our first conversation about reorg happened with um, 
the very first retreat we did um, uh, at the beginning of Mayor Weber's administration when we had uh, Mr. Garza come down from Las Cruces and the the uh, the findings from that retreat was basically was get our house in order and there was a lot of conversation about the shape of the organization how it needs to look so that was that was the beginning of this process so I just want to say the tail the this has been an ongoing conversation for a long time um, we uh, so about the way that the organization should look, what's the right shape. Um, back in January, so pre-COVID, uh, there were conversations amongst department directors, um, uh, the mayor, myself, others trying to figure out what would be the right level, what, would, what kind of reorganization would work. Um, again, back in, back in those times, we were looking at you know, growing budgets, growing staff, how could we be more, um, make progress back faster, um, more, co more coherent. Um, when I became city manager, I started meeting with the, the department directors in teams. Um, and again, those teams were are mirrored in the proposed reorg that we did. And that was um, part, that was for both efficiency and also to give it a try to see what operating in these teams would yield. Um, so that just to sort of color that this has been this has been ongoing. This isn't new out of the blue. Um, the community development piece has been um, circulating for a long time. And I think on the public safety, um, what we're calling community health and safety, uh, there's been a lot of conversations about how could we create a public safety department. That's something that's trending across municipalities across the country. Um, that one seemed, you know, back in January, January when we were starting to look at that, that seemed a much heavier lift, right? It's hard uh, to, uh, to do something like that. So that, that proposal actually is much more of the moment. So once COVID hit um, and we're faced with this draconian budget situation, um, we're looking at um, you know what at one point we thought feared was a 40% cut, we now know to be about 20% cut. How can we, how can we organize ourselves um, smarter, better, more efficient, you know, collaboration happens regardless. This team is amazing on down the line, but how could we organize ourselves so we could be more efficient? Um, so the two big proposals in front of you, again, community development, uh, we've been talking about for a while, uh, community health and safety. That one, again, uh, the public safety piece of it, adding in an overarching element, I think had been uh, looked upon uh, throughout the country, but adding in the community services, I think, is actually really a, a, a product of our moment. And that allowed us to um, take this really progressive move to say, okay, how could a program like MIHO, how could a program like all of the progressive policies we want to see in the way our police department run, how can we leverage our resources and have somebody looking across uh, line, you know, budgets and, um, and programs to really produce efficiency? And the last thing I'll say is on the Parks and Rec, um, again, that was a product, uh, the study session we did for parks uh, well over a year ago, probably, I'd have to check the date, but I think it was February of last year. I was instructed after the study session to look into what it would, uh, what the pros and cons would be of breaking up Parks and Rec. Obviously it's been in different forms, different iterations throughout the years. Um, so all of these have long tails. Uh, because of COVID, um, one of the things we have started but haven't finished that I think remains an ongoing uh, activity, we did uh, put out a call to start employee focus groups to get people's feedback around where efficiencies are, what's working, what's not. Um, those haven't um, had, had a chance to meet yet. Um, but I think what's instructive about, and I agree completely, the, the, more, you the more you have people engaged in a reorg, the better it is. I think what's really interesting about this reorg is it is it's it's bold. It makes some really progressive change, but it also doesn't impact directly a large number of employees. It most dramatically affects department directors. They're they're being um, reshaped, but the uh, there are very there uh, the impact to uh, individuals below uh, that line is not much. So when we're you know we joked back and forth, are we moving boxes or people? We all know that they are people, not boxes, but we are moving these boxes as an entity. Once we, if this is, if this is to be approved, then we start to unpack the boxes and see where there are additional efficiencies. Um, but for right now, most, you know, very few direct supervisors are changing other than four department directors. 
I hope that addresses your question. Uh, well, I certainly have your perspective. Um, you know, reorganizations, you know, start with the communication, start with focus groups. And, and I think it's short-sighted to say that only department directors or these two or three divisions, whatever, departments are the only ones that are affected. And, and you know, it's simply not the case. Uh, but but back to the, the original point is, you know, you start all at all levels across the organization because uh, while you may think that the people aren't affected, a lot of the systems and processes are, and that's the people, the employees do the work. So um, I, I'm just I'm just amazed that it, this this seemed to come out of nowhere, in my opinion. The only thing I got communicated with, and I think the council is part of the communication process, uh, but you know, just a phone call from you and saying here, this is what we're gonna do. That's like all I ever heard about it. And and I, I didn't certainly get any input. I, did, I got nothing. And, and it was just like, here's a phone call. Here's what we're doing. It's, a, it's kind of a done deal in essence, because you know, I wasn't really asked for you know, how I would, recommend any changes but um but the but the thing that surprises me the most other than it seemed to come out of nowhere is that this is being done during a pandemic where employees and and even managers and even yourself are nowhere we're all in they're all in their homes or they're on the trucks uh or in they're in the parks uh and there's there's no real communication. That communication it hasn't gone like both ways, up and down, sideways, cross departments. And I I can confirm that with the amount of calls I'm getting. Uh, and and if you want to truly have an effective reorganization and come out of it with with everybody's you know buy-in, not everybody gets what they want, but some some buy-in. I mean that's really the and all the studies will point to this, that's really the most effective way to do this. I think this has gone on, like during a pandemic, I think it's wrong. Number two, I don't think there's been the, the two-way up and down and sideways communication that should have happened. Work sessions certainly are, are a plus to, to, to talk about and have various work sessions so that you, know, you, you come together, you, you make changes, you go back, you come together with a different plan come and, and do all that. And I don't even know how that can be done on Zoom. It, it's just not effective for such a, a major change. And I don't see it as just a few boxes changing, you know, one box to this box and combine these boxes. I, I just don't see it that way. There's a lot of stress and, and a lot of trauma that's going on behind the scenes about this. And, uh, you know, I, I just don't think this is like the proper way to go about it. And not that I'm necessarily thinking that we shouldn't make some changes. Uh, and I, I do agree with Councilor Lindell's comment the other day where change is hard, but I tell you, it changes even harder when, when, when you had no say so, when you had no opinion, no, it, this just seemed to come out of left field. Um, you know, the other part of reorganization is where you've methodically planned it out. You determine what the new positions will be or what they'll change into. And um, you develop new job descriptions. You prepare the comp, the compensation uh, surrounding those. Uh, you throw those out to the bodies that, you know, the people that they're going to affect or or people who should have some kind of say in, in the comparison. How's, how are you gonna maintain the integrity of the comp plan? How are you gonna maintain the integrity of, of how people's jobs are described? Uh, and, and, they're, and then fold them in to the or organizations that maybe aren't going anywhere. How are you going to, to, to do that? But we went through a budget process uh, that was already kind of in there, but sort of taken out in a way, or those decisions were already made, yet we have, we have, I have seen nothing. I have seen nothing that identifies these new positions, uh, 
you know, when they move to these other organizations, they're still not going to quite have the same exact job. Um, so, so where were those? And I would think that a budget process surrounding the reorg would have been in order to, to have transparency about who's going where, what are their titles going to be called, uh, and how, how we are going to maintain fairness. And so when you design reorganizations, you design them with a flow in mind. How, how are things going to logically flow? And of course, this comes from putting it out there to the people who, who do all of the work. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm still kind of in awe about uh, seniors, the senior, I guess it would be a section now, library sections being folded into a department that includes police and fire. And then now we have a, a city events coordinator and I don't know, maybe all of them. I don't even, I don't even know, but now into the city clerk's office and it, it, I don't know, everybody seems to be, not everybody, but these places that there's no real rhyme or reason to sort of like, let's put them in the city clerk's office. How does that work? I, I'm still kind of trying to figure out a rhyme or reason and what makes sense here. Uh, but I know one thing's for sure, you can put employees you know, here and there and everywhere, but they're still gonna do the work the same way they always did it if they didn't have buy-in. And they don't really know how their jobs are going to change or have changed. And that's a lot of the sentiment that I'm hearing today from our own employees. Um, and, and I think what, what I've seen here is, is, I'm sorry, but I've seen just a, a wham bam, let's throw them up in the air and just put them all where they go and, and not really having a lot of leadership about how this was crafted and how, how it went to the lowest level to build, build upon that so that we come out of this with meeting our goals. And that gets me to the very top of what's in my mind. Uh, what, what was broken and, and what are we fixing? And, and what were the goals? And I know we got these mission statements. Well, did the employees have a say so? And this is the mission. You know, you write mission statements with all across the board and these just appeared recently. I don't know where these came from, but they don't seem to, to hold a lot of a lot of a lot of weight because I, I think somebody just sat in their office and, and wrote them up. And um, you know, I think employees will go just about anywhere you want them, you want them to go if they see a sense of purpose, they were involved in it. And and I really think this thing just took off on a fast track. Uh, I don't think it addresses, I don't even know what it addresses, frankly. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm just stymied that we're in a major pandemic where communication is, is, I think communication suffers with these kinds of meetings. There's, you know, it's hard, it's very hard. And I imagine, Jarrell, that you have a very difficult time because you're the spider that leads out the web, you know, and, and, and I just don't see this is the right timing. I think it's horrible timing. Uh, I think it really cuts off half, if not three fourths of how you reorganize properly. Uh, I think it cuts off all of that communication. And what you have before you is, is a, you know, you can have everything nice and neat on paper, but it's the employees that do the work that are just like question marks all over the place. I wasn't involved in this. Where am I gonna be? What's my job gonna be? Who's gonna be my supervisor? You know, all of this, you know, what's gonna happen to these particular things? And, and, and then I'll get to another point. We have so much turnover in this city right now. I mean, I hear people quitting left and right. They're upset and we've lost a lot of people but we don't have reports on that. We don't have reports on people that are just had it up to here and they're gone, but we do have reports on screaming matches and shouting matches going on. Uh, you know, when employees aren't included in the total picture, they communicate. They communicate. They find ways to communicate. And that's what's going on in our beloved organization. And uh, I am, I, I think this foundation for this reorganization is crumbled and I'm not saying that the city organization can't be better, 
more fine tuned. Uh, we've, we're doing all this without any management training. We haven't really had anything to speak of uh, that address maybe where some things are could be, have been done better and maybe we wouldn't even have some of the issues. But, um, but I think the foundation is very weak and crumbled and I don't think there's been the communication that has been absolutely necessary to have a successful reorganization plan. We're in a pandemic and this is no time at all to be like making this major change. All of the information and the transparency to the city council and to the public about what the true changes are here, what the costs are, what the comp plan is, all of that, it's all non-existent. And I wholeheartedly, right now, in this point in time, I'm terribly against this. I will vote no, even though, uh, you know, they're probably, I mean, I've seen this go through committee, people are just rubber stamping. And uh, I, I just think it's, it's horrible. It's probably one of the worst things that's happened in the organization in a long time. And uh, that's my spiel. I did ask my question, Mr. Chair. And, uh, and this is the first time I've had an opportunity to comment. And that's, that's the way this whole committee structure was designed to be. So that's why I took up all the time tonight in our meeting because you know I have no choice. So um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the indulgence. Thank you, Councilor. Any uh, questions? Any other questions? All right, what are the wishes? Mr. Chair, the Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, I had my hand raised. Uh, sorry, Councilor Garcia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to thank Jarrell for sending the supporting documents that she sent earlier today that I had requested last week. I just have a follow up question um, after reviewing the org chart. And so, from my looks at it, the flow of the org, you know, you got the city of the Santa Fe residents up top, which they're the priority. Then it's broken up into the three streams of the legislative, the executive, the judicial. And I see the city manager only falling under the mayor. Is there a reason for that? Uh, Ms. LePen Hill, do you wanna comment on that? Um, Mr. Chair, Councilor, Councilor Garcia, uh, the city manager is hired and fired by the mayor, along with the city attorney okay. and the city clerk. Right, okay, so. Refer to the city um, attorney for further I, details. I, 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 they're, they're ultimately recommended by the mayor, but they're hired by the governing body. And the governing body also has the authority to remove the city manager. And looking at our city code, um, 2-4.1, Office of the City Manager established, the city manager shall serve at the pleasure of the governing body. We go further on down the city code, 2-4.8, relationship of the city manager with the governing body. The city manager shall be responsible to the mayor and the city council for the efficient administration of all branches and departments of the city government. So I feel that the That's org chart right. does not reflect what is lined out in our city code. And if what is being proposed takes away powers from the city council, and I would absolutely not be in favor of passing this reorganization should that change. I've point seen of, point of information, uh, Chairman Rivera, just a point of information on, on the code. There are some updates needed to chapter two based on our charter amendments. Um, previously, the council could by majority vote remove the city manager. Now it's a super majority. So there has been a few changes, um, but I agree with you. It's by the, con the appointment and consent of the governing body, but there is, there is some changes that are needed to chapter two based on the charter changes that happened a few years ago. Okay, so thank you for that clarification, Ms. McSherry and Duke, and confirming that the city manager is hired by the city council. Um, I'm going off of what we have 
published on our website. So that's, uh, if, if we haven't made the appropriate changes to our city charter and it's published on our website, the, the lack of transparency there is point astonishing to me. Just to, point of information, just to clarify the law on that. The charter is updated. The charter is on our website. There are ordinances okay. that also are on our website that should be updated. We do need some legislation to update that. Okay. But the so, charter so is on my, our website. Okay, so thank you for that clarification, Ms. McSherry. But so to reiterate, 2-4.8, relationship of the city manager with the governing body. The city manager shall be responsible to the mayor and the city council for the efficient administration of all branches of departments of the city government. The organization chart that was proposed to us does not reflect that. It puts all authority under the mayor, which goes against our city code. So I think um, to Councillor B. Hill Coppler's point, efficient planning would have recognized that. And I think if we want to have effective and efficient change to our government, we need to ensure we're doing it in a manner where we are not going against what our current code says. And currently that's what's being proposed. In addition to that, as I mentioned, I feel that that is in some sense trying to pull a fast one on the council by taking some of its power away from them. I don't know how the other councilors feel, but I think that there needs to be that checks and balance. And that's why the city code is written the way it is. So I, I, I I think we need to maybe slow this process down to determine what's the best path forward. Because taking away powers from the city council to give it under the mayor's office is not the appropriate way to move forward. I understand there's proposals to increase the efficiency of government. And there are parts that I do agree with, but taking power away from the city council, I do not agree with. Um, that's all the questions I have, Mr. Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilor Garcia. Ms. McSherry, does the org chart supersede the charter? Chairman Rivera, it does not. Um, and it does not supersede any other code either. I think these are just demonstrative aids. We certainly could add a dotted line between the council and the city manager or whatever. I mean, the, the lines are interpretive, I think. You know, the mayor names the city manager. So you could say, call that a naming line. Um, the council does not name the city manager. So if you interpret the lines as the entity that names the entity below it, I think that would be one way to look at it. I don't think the lines had any sort of definitional E that was associated with them that said this means exclusive and all power um, goes to the person above. Um, I don't think that was the intent. All right, Miss uh, uh, LePen Hill, is it? Uh, I'm sure you can update that box before. Uh before this gets to council. Am I correct in that? Mr. Chair, Councilor uh, Rivera, Ms. Councilor Garcia, the, uh, the org chart was in no way meant to uh, outweigh what is in code and ordinance. It was, as, as city attorney said, a demonstrative, happy to, to make edits, entertain suggestions on a way that you feel visually that would um, be representative. But the org chart itself is a visual aid. It was not meant to suggest any changes that are outside of the charter or the or our city ordinances. Thank you. I, I appreciate uh, the comment, Ms. LePan Hill, but I just going back off of your initial comment that the city manager is hired and fired by the, the mayor. I think that's the wrong perspective to have. You're forgetting about the council and no. to, to think that you certainly serve at the pleasure of the mayor is not true. And, and I don't want that to be forgotten. Mr. And I think it, it, it. Mr. Chair, Councilor Garcia understood, and I, I understand the role of both of all of the elected officials. My. Uh, but, but on that point, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Beta, on that point. The uh, the charter was changed specifically, so that the mayor could get rid of the manager without the council's consent or approval. Is that right, Ms. McSherry? 
Chairman uh, Rivera, Councillor Abeta, that was one of the significant changes, yes. So Councillor Garcia, that one of the problems in the past was there was a concern by the public that the council could pick and choose managers and in some cases hold managers or a mayor hostage by not giving them the consent to get rid of a manager if they wanted to. And I think that even happened not too long ago with one of our former mayors and a city manager he was trying to replace. So it's not, cor it's not entirely correct to say that uh, there, there's that piece that a mayor could get rid of a manager anytime with or without the, the council's consent or vote. Thank you. Thank right. You. No, I, I, I completely understand that, Councillor. But I think the what was being dismissed was the city council's role in, in regards to um, the city council ultimately hires the city manager there with upon the recommendation of the mayor. And I am I complete agreement that both the mayor and the city council can dismiss the city manager. And I think that's what I wanted to reinforce that we don't lose that perspective because um, it was confirmed in Ms. LePan Hill's comments as well as in the org chart that the, the city council was being brought out of the somewhat of the administrative oversight of the city manager's office. Um, you know, there's going to be a time and place where all of us that are participating on this Zoom call are not going to be in these roles. And we want to ensure that in the future, we are practicing the city code and not blurring the lines because, um, you know, and, and, I, and I understand Councilor Rivera's point in regards to does the org chart supersede, but it helps to blur the lines. And especially when we're con conducting the reorg like this, that is very significant. We don't wanna blur the lines. We wanna have it crystal clear. We wanna understand who's going where, who's doing what duties, and when is that gonna happen? Um, and, and I felt uh, the reason why I brought it up is I felt the lines were being blurred and I wanted to ensure that they were crystal clear. So, so thank you for, for letting me comment, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. And I think uh, Ms. LePan Hill acknowledged that and said she would uh, make the change before uh, the council meeting. So I uh, appreciate you bringing that up. Councillor uh, Vihel Kopler, uh, you have your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I just want to cl have clarification. So uh, any city manager that, that has been hired, at least since most of us have been on the council, has come to the council for a, a vote. So I, I see that we hire the city manager based on the mayor's recommendation. So granted, uh, the mayor can terminate the city manager without a vote, but it, can I have clarified that it takes six votes to hire the city manager regardless of the mayor's wish? Is that correct? Chairman Rivera to Councilor B. Hill Coppler, are you saying that it would take six votes of the council if the mayor were not the one dismissing that's the city manager. That's what I understand, is yes. that, that correct? That's correct, yes. So, yeah. so it kind of solidifies Councillor Garcia's point that we do have uh, a role in, in the, at least in the organizational chart uh, where we have some say so as a council over how things are, are managed. And uh, not that that would, you know, be invoked anytime, uh, whatever. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about how how the organization appears to the public, and the fact that this org chart isn't even correct, I think, gives gives uh, credence to my point about how all of this is just like come out of nowhere without required study. Uh, without people having fresh eyes on it. And, and I would go out and venture to say without a real council discussion, which I think uh, is very germane to a work session. And, and none of that has happened. And, and I see this as a, you know, again, uh, somewhat of a, a message of erosion of the city council's authority where, you know, we can't even come up with an organizational chart that, that's correct. And here it is, you know, how many times has this been published? And I'm not sure, but um, I don't consider the session we had with 
Mr. Garza the impetus to, to having this happen. In fact, to the contrary, everything I recalled about that uh, really wasn't necessarily about this. So to start at that point, uh, it, you know, you lost me at that. But at any rate, uh, you know, I, I'm going to say again, I think this thing needs further study. I think it needs definitely needs further involvement by everyone in the organization. And that's not what happened. And I think we're, we're, we're on a fast track that to, to nowhere, frankly. I, I think this is not the way to do a reorganization. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed that that an organization like us who you know should be a leader in in everything that that we do uh ca you know carries on something like this during a pandemic it's it's just beyond belief and uh you know it makes me suspicious so thank you mr chair thank you councillor uh Councilor garcia did you raise your hand again or is that an old uh, it's a new one just for a point of clarification on a uh, point that was brought up earlier by some colleagues. So in section 2-4.3 appointment dismissal of the city manager section, part C says the mayor dis may dismiss the city manager by a majority vote of all the members of the governing body at a regular scheduled meeting. So the mayor can't just dismiss the city manager. I mean, the council is involved in that as well. Uh, Miss uh, McSherry, I see your hand up. Um, Chairman Rivera, Councillor Garcia. So that is part of the code. That's not the charter provision. I can pull up the charter provision if you would like. Okay. No, that's fine. I mean, it's, I think if there are changes to our code, we need to ensure that it's consistent because. Just to clarify, it's a change to the charter. The charter is, is a totally separate piece of our law, kind of like our constitution. And then the code has to follow the charter. The code has not been updated in all respects that it should be. So you need to look at right. a removal right. of the city manager under section 8.04 under the charter. And it says the city manager may be suspended or removed by the mayor or by a vote of six counselors at a regular scheduled meeting. Right, okay, so so to my point of earlier is we need to ensure full transparency people are for me to have to go jumping from one piece of information to another to another is not consistency. And it's, and it leads to, uh, once again, it leads to clouding uh, interpretation. And we wanna ensure if we need to pull down the city code because it's out of date, I'd rather not be up than it be up and wrong. So I, I think that's a different topic we should, we'll need to discuss at a different day, but um, I, I just wanted to clarify what was in front of me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I have a couple of questions. Ms. LePen Hill, um, under normal circumstances, so what I mean is without the whole uh, COVID pandemic, um, would you have taken a different approach to this whole reorganization? Mr. Chair, thank you for the question. Um, I think in many, many aspects of it would have remained exactly the same as I mentioned earlier in my remarks. Uh, back in January, when I became a full-time full city manager, we started having discussions about what a reorg would look like. Um, and, and I was meeting with the, the team that is now um, mo mostly the community development team. So that was, I think, ready to go. I think the the, the time we're in, the COVID pandemic, the dramatic economic collapse we're facing, the uh, uh, social uh, moment we're in with the police allowed us, gave us the, um, the courage to make a progressive mood, move in, su in suggesting the community health and development, uh, uh, community health and safety, I apologize. Um, I think um, so that that is, that is more a by byproduct of this moment, I think seeing the needs our community is. We already we already knew how ma how many needs our community had, and now with this pandemic facing facing us, and I think it's really important to acknowledge uh, the budget situation we're in. That it's actually um, the most opportune time to make changes to your organization. We are down in numbers. We have a hiring freeze. We are at a twenty percent budget, and so our 
what the my philosophy, you know, our organization looks like this. And if we're not going to get, we're not adding new people, you know, we're, we're in a hiring freeze. Our budget is um, in a difficult spot. How do we, what can we do within our organization to make it more efficient, more nimble? And then from there, as we, as we get, you know, we face better days ahead of us, then we can grow from, we can grow from that place. But so now is actually a really important time to take um, some of those, um, uh, opportunities um, and challenges. Reorgs are really hard. They're always hard. They're always difficult. Uh, I couldn't agree more. There, there's no, there's never enough communication. You can always do that better. Um, and I think that it is. Um, so I think this moment it's actually really important because we're also we keep asking our team to do more with less over and over and over again. Um, and this is an attempt. This reorg, all the parts of it, are really to try and again continue to build out our efficiency, be clear when we are no longer gonna choose to, to do something, to take a hard look at what's working and what's not. Um, and if we are, if we stay the same, we stay the same and we're still facing a higher, we're still facing staffing shortages, we're still facing budget deficits um, and we just keep piling on and on. And I think, you know, the exercise when we were facing a 42% looking to budget at a 42% cut, you can't, do that across the board. That decimates an organization. So how do you make your organization look different? And that really, that that exercise, I think, is part is what we're looking at for the city as a whole, which is how do you reshape uh, reshape the organization to make it meet the match the needs of the moment. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Council Lindell. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just have very very brief comments. Um, we all received a, a document called Reorganization Overview. And um, I, I think a point just made that um, with the budget situation that we're in, um, we did everything in the world possible. And when I say we, I, I, I think more of the mayor's office and the city manager's office did everything possible to not have uh, permanent layoffs. And that would have been an easy way out. That would have been much easier. Um, but no one got laid off. And in order to accommodate our future, I think we did need some kind of a reorganization. We had areas that are pretty inefficient. I mean, I have a matrix of a work order of um, whatever a complaint is and who addresses it. And this matrix of responsibility of for illegal dumping, I mean, when is it parks that, that takes care of it? When is it streets? When is it environmental services? When is it code enforcement? When is it transit? This is crazy. I mean, and the other thing I'll say is, I'm trying to keep this really brief. This has been long. Um, I've worked in several fairly large organizations, uh, one of them being a university. No one ever came and asked me if I wanted to be reorged. Um, and you know what? I didn't. But um, I was employed by that organization and it was incumbent upon me to find my way through that and participate and to do the very best I could with what was presented to me. And um, guess what? I was wrong because the reorganization that was proposed in a couple of years really made a lot of sense. Was it hard? Yeah, it was hard because change is hard. But um, when I look at the matrix of this like responsibility matrix of all kinds of different things, like, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It's, you know, that matrix makes it so hard to do things efficiently. And the reorganization overview that we were all given, um, the purpose of this is to save money and to be more efficient. It's, it's not to create hardship for people. And I think it's um, something that 
um, has, has gotten a lot of thought and um, maybe right now is the exact right time to do it. Um, so I'm gonna support this. And um, Chair, are you at a point where um, you would entertain a motion? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna make a motion to approve. I don't have the whole title up in front of me, but um, I make a motion to approve. Second. Motion for approval and a by Councilor Lindell, a second by Councilor Abeta. Any further discussion? We have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Pasula. Chairman Christopher Rivera. Yes. Councilor Roman Abeta. Yes. Councilor Joanne Vijo Coppler. No. Councilor Michael Garcia. I'm going to abstain until changes are made. And Councilor Sydney Lindell. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Pasula. Uh, thank you all for uh, uh, doing so well in a lengthy meeting. Um, with that, let's just move on. Any matters from staff, uh, Mr. Romero? No, Mr. Chair, no matters. Uh, Mr. Jones? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, thank you. All right, any matters from the committee? Councillor Vigil Cobbler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I wanted to bring something to John Romero's attention. I got a call from a constituent saying that the, the building that's going on um, at the corner of Mission Bend and Richards Avenue, I think she said it's home-wise, that there, there's no dust control with that project. and. Uh, she says it's really, really bad, and I wondered if you could follow up on it, because I, I do believe we have some dust control measures, don't we, when building is going on? Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilor Bill Copter, that is correct. So I will work with uh, land use to make sure we have that developer uh, address those issues. Okay, that'd be great, because uh, she's, she's really going crazy over all the dust and she's kind of calling on behalf of all of them that live through there. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else from the committee? I see no hands up. Uh, nothing uh, under matters from the chair. With that, our next meeting is Tuesday, September 8th. Uh, with that, we are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you.